welcome to the Retro Blood. You are all my children now. You want to know what happens to an eyeball when it gets You got any idea how much blood jets out of a guy's neck? You've come back to us, Michael. You can stop the rage. Jason is alive. We dug up his body. I was gonna cremate it. Whoa, whoa. What's your name, son? Well, Tommy Jarvis, but look, we've gotta do something. He's even more powerful now. Aren't you the kid whose mother and friends were killed by that maniac? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jason murdered them. Been in some psychiatric clinic ever since. We'll tear your soul apart. <laughs> Be afraid. No. Be afraid. Be very afraid. Welcome back, everybody, to the Retro Blood. As we continue this all star Halloween extravaganza month, talking all the Friday the 13th 1980s films. Up next, if you like telepathic girls who throw TVs at people. If you like teens who show up and all have sex at the exact same time, which that has to be like a record. You know what I mean? Like couples just having sex, like they timed it all at the same time. If you like, yeah. if you like Jason being all wet, all right, with, with, with bones hanging from him, you know what I mean? Then this is mm-hmm. the review for you, brother, because the retro blood is talking all about the new blood the new blood friday the 13th part 7 the new blood james klein jay austin what's happening allison what's coming what's going on what's up man um we are powering through this ho- uh, halloween holiday season aren't we? i know like we're already at fucking we're seven there. can you believe it we're almost at the end seven which is crazy i know i know it's almost at the end of the 80s we um we've watched seven of these things in a row <laughs> it's wild. and it and it sh- and it shows <laughs> um i don't know i don't know how i feel about this um uh, movie we'll, we'll get into it later on i'm sure yeah um yeah everything's going great man halloween's awesome it's the best time of the year yeah right, buddy. next to christmas right yeah yeah man so, this could be yeah. we're, we're already rocking it you know this halloween season you know we did uh we did part five and part six of the fridays already mm-hmm. so now we're deep into the reviews we got the new blood then we got the um Manhattan one. Oh boy. Yeah. That's coming up next Jason, week. Um, Jason takes Manhattan. Jason or takes is Manhattan. That what it's or, is that the, or is that the Muppet one? No, Muppets I think take it, Manhattan. No, I think it is Jason takes Manhattan. So huh. but um but yeah, I mean this this new blood one is pretty interesting though. Like some I this to me, you know, when we do our little quick thoughts at the beginning, to me this one wasn't like that bad, but it did get the old uh, century treatment that I think it made yeah. it not as uh, not as uh, good as it could have been. Because, you know, when I was doing some of my research and watching some of the deleted scenes, I was like, you know what, man, they should have just kept that shit in there. But I know they couldn't at the time because they kept getting the uh, century overload at the time. But, you know, this one's, a like I said, an interesting one. <laughs> well, we'll get into all that. But yeah, I'm drinking the... Uh, the Highland Brewing Seasonal Claw Hammer Oktoberfest, brother. So, you know, I'm keeping that oh, Oktoberfest yeah. beer strong in the month of October. It's one of my favorite yeah. beers. One of my favorite uh, my favorite styles of beer is Oktoberfest. I love those. Yeah. Yeah. Oktoberfest uh, in Germany is like at the end of September, and it ends like the first week of October, I believe. So this is the last week of Oktoberfest in Germany. But we can still enjoy the beers. Brother, Oktoberfest <laughs> is the whole fucking month for me. <laughs> All right. Especially when watching this oh. shit, brother. You know who's a big Oktoberfest fan? Is our boy Eddie from this yeah. movie. Not, not yeah, only was I, he a, like a, a science film nerd who thought he was going to get some ass from that blonde girl, Melissa. He also is an avid Oktoberfest uh, beer drinker. He told me himself. So, yeah, I've got a, I've got a lot to say about that guy, and we'll get there. Um, I have my own uh, my typical uh, Modelo, you know, my Modelo beers. 
Yeah, got that Mandela, I'm brother. No Budweiser. All right, we didn't see no, no Budweiser. No, no Budweiser. Listen. I'm a little bit higher class than Budweiser. We now. did get a. Let's we go. did get a couple stuff back from the Jason. We did. We got. We, did. we got the cars. You know, failing. We got the tits yeah. and we got the weed. So at least we got that. And back. the flashback. Oh, and the flashback too. Yeah. So you know, I. In you case know, you don't know who Jason is. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> I like it how, like, you know, we had to stop the flashbacks for, like, a movie or two. But now we got them right yeah. back, brother. You know, it seemed like that fucking, that one we did last week was, like, you know, like, it didn't have any of the, the Friday the 13th, like, stuff in it. You know, no, where Jason terrible. lives. I it, hated that movie. Yeah. So, I was like, fuck it. Which is, which is not what I thought going into it, which is probably one of the reasons I didn't like it so much, was because I, I thought I would like it better than I did. Um, but... It, I mean, it got the editing, the censoring treatment, so it was all edited down, and it was basically like watching a Frankenstein movie. Which, I mean, the guy that directed it, that was kind of like what his intention was, anyway. Yeah, but um, you know, this guy, I'm not really sure what his intention was. Yeah, other I mean, than yeah, I'm not talking. He about- wanted to, he wanted, he wanted to make. I know that he in an interview he said he wanted to make Jason look like he'd been through some shit. Yeah, but like instead of just being a normal guy. So the whole concept of this movie. You know, when we talk about it, it's going to be very interesting and long form. Uh, it just, but the whole t- telekinesis thing and what they were trying to go with, I and mean, they were trying to like take this in a, like this like a different direction. But you know, we'll we'll get there. But we have a lot to talk about. Yeah. Like on every retro blood, we talk about what is happening in the world of pro wrestling and metal around the movie release date. The reason we do this, everyone, is because we try to tr- create. A whole weekend, a whole uh, uh, party for everybody. All right. Mm-hmm. Or as my main man Dusty Rhodes says, he loves Tampa, he loves the party, and he loves rednecks. All right. And uh, on on this retro blood, we love horror movies, we love metal, and we love the re- pro wrestling. So. And that's what we talk about. That's what we talk about, brother. So, this has a very special release date, Allison. Do you know that? Um, special in what way? Special has in your boy was born. Uh, well, it's his birthday when this movie really? came out. Yes, May thirteenth, nineteen eighty eight. Now, in in shoot, I was only three years old. Okay, but on the retro blood, I'm a spanking twenty one, leather jacket, beer drinking. All right, Le- I'm kind of like our boy Greg Valentine from from uh, yeah. From, from rock and roll brother all right so this this has been my my birthday present would see not only we'd be seeing the new blood okay but we'd also be heading down to tampa florida brother and watching some mm-hmm. wcw mm-hmm. world championship wrestling matches out to tampa mm-hmm. florida for a saturday night taping all right yeah that would have been that would have been a great weekend yeah cuz it'd been the 13th is when the movie came out. Then the 14th yep. is when this show happened in Tampa. So, and this this is a this is a pretty crazy show I want to talk about. So, I know you didn't have a chance to see it cuz you're out there living the gimmick of traveling. I was right? I was living the gimmick of traveling, so I did not get a chance to watch it. I did want to ask you about that, but I know it might take a while. Maybe we'll do that a little separate <laughs> separate time cuz I'm pretty sure you have a it, a ton to talk about up there in it Canada, could brother. It take a while, yeah. Yeah, I was on the road in Canada for a week, so it could it could indeed take. A Maybe while. I'll put that as a special on the YouTube page. <laughs> Allison's <laughs> trip to Canada, <laughs> brother. All right. But uh, if we would have made the trip in the '80s, brother, to Tampa, uh, we this episode was pretty interesting. So if you all want to see this episode, you go to the cock, the peacock. Okay. Yep. And on you go cock. to uh, May Fourteenth, nineteen eighty eight. This one's actually labeled. You know, you go under the old WCW Crockett. And it's mm-hmm. season four, episode 20. <clears throat> and uh, the big thing about this show is, so this is the point where, like, for like Crockett, it was pretty much, I believe, this merger happened, or it, it's probably going to be like a year and two into this merger of, you know, Crockett mer- merged with the uh, um, the UWF, I believe. You know, the old Mid-South. So they have, like, a shit ton of talent at this time, and really good talent. Okay, and the big thing about this uh, episode was this was the episode where Barry Windham, like a, a like a couple days earlier, joined the Four Horsemen for the first time. 
So pretty oh, much, wow. yeah. Okay. So pretty much the whole show was centered around all these baby faces talking about Barry Windham joining the Four Horsemen. So, and it was also uh, we also got a really uh, interesting segment with the uh, Jim Cornette and the Midnight Express uh, celebrating a little bit too soon about trying to win some belts. So. But I'll get into. It. I know you didn't watch this episode, Allison, but I will. I, I will explain it to you, and yep. uh, I'm pretty sure you're you're gonna like this episode or what we probably would have saw. So yeah, explain <laughs> it to me and all the people out there. So, so we start off a little bit with the clip of uh, Jim Cornette and the Fantastic. We actually saw this twice for some reason. Not really sure why, but it was Jim Cornette and like they have like you know birthday hats on, like you know those little birthday cone hats. Okay. And they have like uh, mm-hmm. birthday uh, uh, whistles, and they're throwing like confetti in the air. Because yes. uh, David Crockett comes up, he's like, "I gotta tell you." He's like, "Yeah, yeah, I know what you're gonna tell me." So I guess Jim Cornette. So what happened was the Fantastics beat the Midnight Express for the for the belts. I believe is the U.S. They have so many fucking belts, but I think these ones were the USWA belts or something like that. Mm-hmm. And they. Jim Cornette thought that that um, Jimmy Crockett was going to reverse the decision, okay, and give the belts back to the Midnights. Uh, and I like I like Jim Cornette on here. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know Jimmy. Like I even voted for him to be president. I was like, that would have been something. <laughs> okay. Wow. Yeah. So David's like, no, the, the decision's been made. So now Jim Cornette's all like pissed off with stuff. And this is a pretty funny scene because they're all dressed up in like party gear. They think it's going to be a big party, but their party has been ruined because they're not going to be getting by the, the bells by, 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 the, by the Jimmy man. So yeah, this the is the powers that be. So this is a weird interview. So I do not remember. And you could tell me if you remember this, Allison. Do you remember Nikita Koloff with hair? No. Okay. Well, you had fucking hair here. Like he had like that, like, you know. Minnesota looking buzz cut. And I was like, what in the fuck am I looking at? Like I wow. when we when we talk about Nikita Koloff, most of the time some jacked up fucking, you know, beef dude. You know what I mean? With bald head and shit and a goatee. Alright? <laughs> this one I get like Minnesota looking <laughs> Nikita Koloff, fucking buzzed hair and shit, and like he looks like my uncle or some shit. You know what I mean? Like my my my, my uncle lifts weights or some shit. And then he he's still talking in his Russian accent. Just I was about really, to say he's still doing the Russian thing though, yeah. right? He but he's a face now, right? Yeah, he's a face now. Yeah, he's been like a face yeah. for a little while, and he's basically talking about three main things. He's talking about Gary Hart and Al Perez, and he's also talking about Barry Windham turning heel and joining the Four Horsemen. And I guess there was a thing going on at the time where Sting and Barry Windham they would take the Four Horsemen and they would like. You know that symbol they, the four horsemen did where they put the four in the air? Well, they would take yes. it down and they would swing it like it's a dick. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> so I was like, okay. That's fantastic. It's just really weird seeing uh, Nikki Koloff with hair. Like, I was like, bro, can you just shave it? Like, it's freaking me out. So then we get a Fantastics match. And these guys are basically good old Southern boys. All right. They're like heart, like the heart throbs at the time, and every word out of their mouth when they were done was like, "Yes, we love you guys, we love you fans, and the belts. These belts aren't going anywhere, brother. We're good old Southern boys, and these belts are staying with us." Yep, we're we're super faces, and we're from the South, and you love us, and we're gonna keep these belts forever because we like belts. That's pretty much the promo. Like you nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. <laughs> I knew it. I like, knew it. I think we could be the fantastic. You know what I mean? Go out there. We could be the fantastic. Get, just get a little tan, get some blonde hair. You know what I mean? Yeah, mostly because we're fantastic. We might need to wax a little bit, but you know it. Yeah, maybe. It maybe really we're, both, we're both kind of like werewolves. That's true. Maybe there's like a werewolf fantastics. Yeah, there might be. You know yeah. what I mean? Like we could be like we could be like the werewolf fantastics. Maybe that could. That'd be a fun be gimmick. gimmick. I'd do it. Werewolf fantastic. You know I mean? Yeah, sounds good to me. I think we just created a new gimmick here. That would be pretty fun. What a tag team. What would, our, what would our finish be? You know, the claw? Oh, uh, oh, no. It should be the Doomsday Device. That's the best tag team finisher of all time. Really? I kind of like the 3D. Oh, the 3D is pretty cool, too. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. You're right. There's yeah. a lot of good ones out there. We can go on for about it. 
So the next match we have, speaking of a gimmick, we have Dr. Death in a squash match. And boy, this Dr. Death back in the day, this guy was a tank. Like he was humongous. Mm -hmm. He wasn't like Royd humongous. He was just a big guy, like a big brick house looking guy. And uh, he's in a, uh, uh, there's a lot of people like in the feud with like a lot of baby faces are like talking about, like I said, this whole episode and everything was basically a lot of the top baby faces talking about the four horsemen and they're talking about Barry Windham turning, turning heel. So <laughs> you guess, cause before, uh, before this, yeah. Barry Windham had been a face, right? Yeah. Yeah. He was actually, he was okay. like one of the top faces and actually one of the top four horsemen heels at the time. And I believe that he was actually tagging up with Sting and Lex Luger at this time. And he actually turned on them to join the Four Horsemen, I believe. I could be wrong about that one. But I know he did turn on uh, one of the two to to do, to gain and to be uh, the newest member of the Four Horsemen after, after they kicked Lex Luger out. So, check out this next match. This is a rant. This is a two retro blood stars coming back, brother. We have the tag team of Jimmy Garvin with mm -hmm. Baby Doll. And a retro blood classic, Ron Garvin, brother. All right. Hands the, of stone. Hands of stone. The most, like, generic <laughs> 80s wrestler, <laughs> but he was everywhere. I mean, everywhere. Well, yeah. Everywhere. I love Ronnie Garvin. I think he's great. I like Ronnie Garvin, too. Don't oh, get me wrong. Yeah, Ronnie Garvin. Yes. Yeah. And they're not as flashy as Jimmy. No. No, exactly. No. Uh, so then they were facing the varsity club. Okay. Okay. And what's weird about this one, I think it was just a announcer's mistake, but the announcer was like, right, up next with the varsity club, we have Mike Rotunda and we have Mike Steiner. And I was like, Mike Steiner, who the Mike fuck Steiner. is that? <laughs> but I think he just fucked up. I was like, is Rick Steiner's real name Mike at this whole time? Like, this is like a different universe. But this uh, this varsity club is weird because it had like Rick Steiner and it had um, Mike Rotunda in their you know their leather Letterman's jackets and everything, and then he had like Kevin Sullivan just come out there in like some sinister robe, like while oh. the, while, while the college music was playing. <laughs> oh, so he hadn't switched from the evil guy. Yet. No, he was still doing his evil gimmick while but he, he was, was in the varsity. Yeah, because oh, yeah. That's that's because weird. later on he would come out and do the whole Leatherman's jacket, you know. Yeah. But, but I yeah. guess he didn't switched over yet, so you just see him coming out in this sinister robe with some like some like college music playing, some college football music playing in the background. It was kind of, it was kind of, um, it just didn't go. It was weird. But the weirdest part of this match was, I didn't catch who took her, but there was either it was either Ron, or, it was either uh, Mike or Rick, or somebody took a baby doll to the back. So the match ended in a count out because the uh, the baby faces went to go find her and then they found baby doll in like this closet and then she was pissed off and wanted everybody to leave like Jimmy and, and, and Ron to leave because she got kidnapped and she was like acting like a fit. It was kind of weird. Okay. It was just that strange. Odd, yes. Yeah, that's how the match. It was just strange. She was like, I, I, you know, it, it, it could be because you know we're not watching these shows like every week and shit. So I mean, there might be something going on. But she was just basically so freaked out that she didn't want anybody to be there, and they cut the cameras off. So up next we have Al Perez, and we've always talked about Al Perez, but I wasn't like super familiar with him. And he's actually not a bad wrestler. Like he's pretty good. Like he's a pretty big dude too. Pretty jacked up dude. And uh, he won his squash match. And the big thing about this one was we had a Gary Hart promo. And boy, you cannot do this promo nowadays, even though I bet a lot, bunch of people would love to do this promo. His promo is basically like, is like, yeah, you fucking, all you people, you fucking liberals out there, you all fucking love this, uh, this, this uh, 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 Nikita Koloff. You all love him because he, he defected from Russia. He's like, I don't care if he defected from Russia. Yeah, you know I mean, he's here right now. This is my border, brother. This is my America. And I was like, man, this is happening right now. That's crazy. Wow. Does he really say that? Yeah, he says all that. Wow. It's crazy. Wow. Okay. All right. Like he even go he even goes more detailed than what I'm saying here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, damn, okay. We we don't give a shit in his eighties. And then basically yeah, they're they're no, building up a time. Yeah, yeah, they're building up a free feud between Al Perez and Nikita Koloff. So then we have Dusty Rhodes do a promo. 
after this. And this is when he get, he does the, uh, the, the line I said at the beginning of the show. He's like, I love Tampa, Florida. This is the party city. I love the party. I love this wrestling. And guess what? I love all you rednecks. <laughs> <laughs> so good. So he's talking it's about so he the same thing. He's talking about Barry Windham joining the Four Horsemen. He's basically out to get him. And this is when we're going to see clips of the, um, at the end, we're going to see the clips of Dusty versus Tully Blanchard in a bull rope match. So then we have a Sting. He's here. Bro, this 80s Sting, godly, no wonder he was so popular. This guy was fantastic. For the squash match he did, I was like, damn. Like, I'm surprised Sting wasn't bigger than he was. You know, he was a big star. But like, bro, I think this guy could have been like, you know, like the new, you know, I don't know. This, it just feels like Sting could have been like even bigger than he was. And he was big. Well, as I say, he was yeah. big. I mean, he was one of the biggest guys they had for sure. But, you know, he could yeah. have. Because uh, people were going crazy you know, for this guy when he came out. I but mean, he was also just starting to like he was just starting to get really big at this point. Yeah. So he he was he was already been in um, a fuse with the four horsemen and everything. He beats his jobber, puts the scorpion deathlock on him, talks about how he loves the party in Tampa too, and that this whole place is a party. I was like, hell yeah, brother, I'm ready to party too. Let's party. You know, I got the new blood. You know what I mean? Got some telekinesis mm-hmm. shit going on here. I got some weed. I got some blondes. Let's party too. So Sting, Let's do it. you know, Sting would have loved the new blood. Um, I think he would have fit right into this movie. You know, he could have been. Um, he could have replaced Nick. You know what I mean? <laughs> he could have. He for sure. Could have like that's what I was thinking the whole time watching Sting. I was like, you know what? He would have been great this new blood movie. He could have fought Jason. All right, I believe. Oh it. well, yeah, that would have been the end of the movie if he'd have fought Jason. Exactly. Now. Put him in the put him in the Scorpion, brother. So the same thing. He's talking about Barry Windham turning heel and everything, and he's like, hey, don't worry about that. You guys, you guys, you want to go to the Flair side? I got fucking Nikita. I got Dusty. I got Doctor Death. I got all these people. So I'm like, oh shit, are they setting up a war games? Let's go, brother. So Sting got me all hyped for this show. He was probably my favorite part of this show. Besides uh, this one match coming up. So then we got a flare. Now we got to hear from the heels. Okay. So then we got a flare promo talking about Barry joining and, and why he was getting uh, uh, Barry joining. So, you know, Space Mountain's on uh, on the road now. Okay. Oh. And then he's like, what's Kyle's and all this? That used to be one of his lines to flare. And... Now we have Tully talking why Barry joined the Four Horsemen. And I, everything was basically kind of like drawn out. You know what I mean? They're like, oh, yes, he was joining because why wouldn't he join? He was joining because we're the best group of wrestling. Why wouldn't you be part of the best group of wrestling? You know, it was kind of like those kind of answers. And then Arn gives his thoughts about Barry joining. I was like, okay. And then we got Barry having his thoughts about him joining. <laughs> so it all, ha- it all happened on the same episode. <laughs> So we all had to speculate about why Barry joined, and then Barry just speculate or Barry then told us why he joined. I got yes, it. he joined. You know mm-hmm. why he joined, Allison and everybody. You know why? Because he wanted for to. the money. No, because he wanted oh, to. That's he wanted he to. Okay, yes. that's what he said. He said Fair enough. Because he Fair enough. He wanted to beat everybody, and he basically wanted to beat everybody and join the best group of wrestling because he wanted to. Okay. So now we have the best match in the show, and to be honest with you, this match was fucking awesome. Okay, it was a beef match between the powers of pain, the barbarian, and the warlord versus the road warriors. Oh my god! Ooh, fuck, bro. <laughs> These guys are just beating the shit out of each other, flexing. Their fucking traps are bigger than my whole body. <laughs> I was like, fuck, bro. These guys are gigantic. You know what I mean? They oh, should yeah. just they should just went out and posed. That's all you gotta do. Yeah, I don't even know how a ring could contain all of that. Oh, no, I can't. It c- it couldn't, brother. Okay? There's too much man in that ring, brother. Just slapping everybody. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Holds, punches. You know what I mean? Fucking slam. Bro, the power slams they did? Uh, fucking okay. great. Okay? So, the big thing about this match is they got Hawk right, and they slammed him on a chair. So, Hawk's back's all messed up. And then the Barbarian goes up onto the fucking top rope and splashes his ass on the chair and he gives him a chair shot to the back 
And you would have thought this fucking hawk is crippled, brother. You would have thought this thing was a shoot. These fans are so pissed off. Everybody's all pissed off. So it was a disqualification for kicking Hawk's ass. <laughs> it was a great match, bro. I hardly. Yeah, I mean, it sounds amazing. Yeah, if you I'll have, go back and watch that. Yeah, it's great. All the all the matches on this show, like to be honest with you, you could probably skip them because most of them were just a bunch of squash matches. But this match, this match was the the best one to see. Uh, when it comes to the match, all the promos were good. Like I said, you know, Crockett and stuff. They they. They they were kind of known for everybody being pretty strong on their promos. Not every, you know, obviously not everybody, but there was a vast majority of the wrestlers in the Crockett area that were really good on on promos. And then we just get like it was only like ten minutes of like the beginning of the uh, Dusty versus Bull Ro- versus Tully in the Bull Rope match, and then we just cut off. So, but you know. Not a bad episode, brother, you know, for this uh, New Blood weekend. So, uh, definitely fun. You know, every time you go to a Crockett show, especially during this era and stuff, the whole 80s era, you would, uh, you know, they weren't as hot as they probably were in like 85 and stuff when we were talking about them, but they're still, they're still going strong. So Yeah, they and, and like you mentioned, <clears throat> you mentioned War Games, but there was a War Games um the next month, I believe. Okay, that makes sense. Because the, the way um, Sting was building it up, it seemed like there was going to be. Yeah, there, there was going to be. There's, they were. They've actually did a couple, but they also did one. Um, I thought they did one on pay per view, or what their version of pay per view was that year, but maybe they didn't. Um. Oh yeah. Uh, no, never mind. They didn't. But yeah, there was one coming up the next month. They did a. It was a typical Four Horsemen versus. Uh, Dusty, uh, the Road Warriors, and somebody else, and nice. a couple other people, but uh, uh, but yeah, so they were doing them like actually quite a bit around that time, so that would make sense. They probably he probably was alluding to a war games match they had coming up. Yeah, it had to be the way he was doing that promo. I was like, okay, we're, we're definitely building, and just how everybody was talking about Barry, but we I could I could tell it was going towards a war games match. So, but to move on to the metal music, there's something else I found too. You know what I mean? So this mm-hmm. album came out on my birthday, May 13th, 1988, which is a Friday the 13th, by the way, too. So we got that trend going on as well. I know. All right. Which I'm guessing is why this came out in May. Yes. Yeah, pretty Yeah, pretty much. They were trying to line it up just to get right there on the Friday the 13th. But Judas Priest is back on the Retro Blood Brother, and mm-hmm. we're going to be talking about their album, Ram It Down, Brother. And I love this album. Like it's a great album. Like um, like when we were talking about Juice Piece before, we talked about a tour they did a couple of episodes back. You know, like I was saying, I wasn't super familiar with them, even though I have seen them live before. So when they were coming up again, I was like, okay, you know, since we're talking about them and stuff, and they were pretty prominent during the '80s, might as well check out this album. And bro, right from the beginning, I was like, I'm hooked. Like this album was fucking great. You know, right so- from the beginning, song and everything. Yes. So here's the thing. So I remember the day I bought this. I remember when this came out um, on the the very week that little James was in the hospital being born. Well, I was three. No, I was three. And shoot, like, oh, you were three. three. I forgot. I forgot. Yes, you were three. Now, so on your third birthday, (laughs) I remember buying this album. Well, hold on a second. And shoot, I was three years old. When it comes to Retro Blood, brother, I was buying this album too, drinking a beer. That's true, with uh-huh. your mustache and your uh, yeah. leather jacket. Yeah. Um, with the eagle yeah. on it. With the eagle on it, yeah. You, you can't miss the and eagle. And a fanny right. pack. Yes. And the jeans that are tucked into the boots, bro. I got the whole gimmick, okay? <laughs> with a chain around the ankle of the boots. Yeah. Got to have that, too. Got to have that, With the too. one glove on. Um, uh-huh. With one glove. All right, we, now we've gone too far. Anyway, I remember when this came out and like I was still kind of like, you know, in my infancy of picking out my own music and stuff. But I remember this coming out and I remember around that time, a lot of people didn't like Judas Priest for some reason, although they were a huge band. Yeah. Like, you know, they were selling out arenas and stuff. They were a huge band. A lot of people didn't like them because the album they did before this Turbo and even the album before that somewhat had a lot of keyboards and synth stuff in it. Yeah. And it just was considered, they just weren't considered as heavy. Um, and, but I mean, but I bought this because 
I, I think I'd heard that you got another thing coming, but I really didn't know much about Judas Priest. I was really, honestly, I mean, I know people say this, and, and, and I guess maybe like people don't really believe it, but like I was honestly buying a lot of the music I bought based on what the album cover looked like. Um, you know, good. that's why I bought Iron Maiden's Live After Death. I had no idea what Iron Maiden sounded like um, when I first bought that. But like I bought this based on that cover art. Judas Priest, I knew that they were a heavy band. Love that cover. I'm like, okay, I'm going to buy this. It's new. I'm going to buy it. I was blown away. Like, I could not believe what was coming out of my headphones. Like, I immediately put it in my little Sony Walkman, put my headphones on, and from that, just opening, just like scream from Rob Halford, that yeah. real loud, this the whole thing starts. Oh my God, I was immediately blown away. That first song, Ram It Down, I cannot believe they don't play this song live. I know, neither. They it's haven't played great. it since that, since 1988, I don't think. I cannot believe it. Like, it's four and a half minutes long, and a minute and a half of that is guitar solos. Yeah. Yeah, they they they, they like, do the draw. Yeah, they do one there and the heavy metal and love zone. Almost yeah. always, all of them have fucking guitar <laughs> solos. I'm like, damn, they're just fucking shredding this shit up. Yeah, but like it goes into that thing, that little um, that little shouted out part in the middle where it kind of slows down for a minute. And then the drums kick back in, and then like KK Downing and um, KK, what's the other guy's name? It's just love me. KK Downing and Glenn Tipton. Just like they just they're just like shredding back and forth playing these guitar solos. And then, like, they're playing this guitar solo together where they're both tapping and they go, okay, this is going to be it. And then I'm going to go back into the chorus. But nope. Then KK comes right back of it again and starts just shredding on the guitar. And then they go back and forth. Then finally, the chorus comes back in. Ram It Down is amazing. I cannot believe, like I said, I cannot believe they don't play this song now. That would blow yeah. people's minds. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I know. They play that today. I think the last one that it was recorded that they actually played from this album. Which is in one of the tours they did during the 2011 2012 was the Blood Red Skies, which is kind of like a slower yeah. song. Yeah, I know it's weird. They play that slow song. They play the slow song off of it, and I think they play. They played one other song. Yeah, it's the I Am um, Rocker. I Am Rocker. Yeah, um, which is okay song. But but yeah, they played. It's this album is so good. I know, and it doesn't Especially get the, the recognition that it deserves. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. As I'm saying, because like I was saying. Like I've heard some Judas Priest, and I was like, okay, they're okay, you know, you know, you know. Sometimes it takes me a little while to get into certain bands and stuff. Um, but I was like, you know, I saw this album it came up on my birthday, and I was like, well, fuck it, just check it out. And I was just like, man, from the very first song, I'm like, bro, let's go, let's party, bro. I'm like, Sting, like the, Sting would love this album. Fucking just party, okay. We got the New Blood over here. They're partying to this album too. It was great. But uh, there's some there's some background that's pretty interesting about this album too. So, apparently, in 1986, Judas Priest, they intended to release a double album entitled Twin Turbos, okay? Of which half would consist of melodic, more commercial hard rock, and the other half would be heavier and less um, synth-driven. But the Columbia Records Mm. didn't like that idea of the double album concept. And so the project was ultimately split into two separate releases. So we had 1986 Turbo, and then we had 1988's Ram It Down. So they didn't do that. Yes. that. I guess they originally tried to do like a a double album with two different sounds on it, which is kind of a neat idea. You know? Yeah, I mean, I think that would have been a cool idea. The Twin Turbos idea, I like. I, I, it'd been kind of cool if they did like you know one one, one disc was like Turbo, and then one disc yeah. was Ram It Down. Although they sound completely different, so I, I guess I could see. Well, I mean, they would have done it had it not been for the record company. I don't know why record companies don't like double albums, especially in the '80s, but they don't. It's probably Unless because it's you get more album. money. It's probably yeah. because you get more money doing two two separate ones. You know what I mean? Maybe, and the cost is probably way more. Yeah, I don't know what the costs were then, but I know now pressing a gatefold for a double record costs more than twice the amount of pressing a single one. Interesting. Um, so I'm sure it costs a lot more, but it's not like they weren't one of the biggest bands in rock music. Yeah, you know, I, I don't know. I think it's weird that labels do that, but it is so apparently it is. there's four songs that were supposed to be on that Twin Turbos project, which is "Ram It Down," "Hard as Iron," "Love You to Death," and "Monsters of Rock." So they were mm-hmm. all written for the Twin Turbo, which you could tell like they were trying to be a little more heavier on those songs too, which is cool. So we have a couple things. So we had two people leave after this album. One was the producer, Tom, okay, who did, yeah. it was basically their whole producer throughout their whole run. Because this, like, this is like their 11th album. 
So they're like yes. deep and deep heavy, you know. And then we also have the drummer left too, David Holland. Uh, he left the band after this as well too. And they would both return yeah. later on, later on. But then during this particular part, they both left. So, um, so the band also recorded a rendition of Chuck Berry's Johnny B. Was it Goad? Johnny B. Good. Have you never heard that no, song? No, no, it's oh, okay. Is it good? But I think the, the song they, they made it a little different. It's Johnny B. G O O D E. Well, that, that's just how they spell it. On okay. Here. So Johnny B. Good. But it's, it is supposed to be Johnny B. Good. Yeah. So I, apparently, also, this song was supposed to be included to the 1988 Anthony McCall comedy film, Johnny B. Good. The song found its way onto Ram It Down and was the album's first single. Yeah. Not a bad song. Yeah, the original, the Chuck Berry version is spelled that way too, but I don't know why. Oh, okay. So this is good. But I, e. I just, yeah, I don't like, because it's, it's listed out like Johnny B, like it's his middle initial and then good with an E at the end of it, but I have no idea why that is. But So good D? I think it's the weakest <laughs> song on the album. I could have done without yeah. that. Yeah, I think it was too. Like, it was, yeah. It's, it wasn't, I after listening to most of the stuff, I wasn't really my my cup of tea for that particular song so so originally the song thunder road was to be put on the album however after the album producers were asked to do the cover of johnny be good thunder road was replaced some of the parts from the song made it into the cover of johnny be good thunder road was released has a bonus track on the 2001 remastered of point of entry yeah so, yeah, so basically, they rewrote the music entirely for Johnny B. Good. Yes. Like, it doesn't even have the same Chuck Berry music. It just uses his lyrics. Yeah, the basically. lyrics, yeah. And I, it was okay. I don't know. Like, for, like I think I'm, I kind of with you. Like, I don't, I didn't really like this song at all either on there. I, I didn't think it would flow with the rest of the, with the, um, with the album. But, you know, yes. it is what it is. So, but apparently, the marks. Okay. Apparently, the Marks weren't really uh, happy about this album. They they found, they were negative on it, and I was like, "Well, fuck you, Fat Marks." All right. I love this. Yeah, album. I, I I think it's weird, right? Well, okay. Yeah. I guess it. I guess not. I guess it. I guess it does make sense when you look at the time because Judas Priest was super popular doing what they were doing with Turbo and Defenders of the Faith and the more synth heavy sound, and then they go with this. And I could see how the people who loved that stuff didn't like it. Um, like all the people I knew in school at that time were like really super into like metal, you know, like Slayer and things like that. So that's, and they, I think a lot of those older kids that I knew then had gotten out of Judas Priest and in, and into bands like Slayer because of the sound that Judas Priest was, was taking. So, yeah, I mean, it makes sense, I guess, that um, a lot of, mainstream fans wouldn't like this because it was harder again um but it only got to like uh, i think like in the 30s like number 31 on the charts which is yeah. not good for a, a 1980s record um you know you, you know your records records should be selling in that time people are still buying records and records should be selling enough to get you higher than that so and in the 30s is not great yeah but you know sometimes things age differently and i thought this was great they do so Ron Halford's his take on the album, all right, is is, is a very heavy record, all right, for, for which for them it was, and he said that yeah. uh, with uh, Glenn Tipton and KK Downing really ripping it on a lot of the, those riffs. So uh, Halford also said that that the band recorded a cover of the Rolling Stones "Play with Fire." He said it was a shame that the song did not make the album. So. I think that song would have been better than Johnny Be Good. Yeah, definitely. But they were trying to get on that soundtrack, though. So I sort of understand that. I can't hold it against them. Yeah, and that's a big thing, you know, getting on movie soundtracks or, yes. you know, because, like, it, it definitely, you, there is a, probably a couple bands that I found out because of movie soundtracks. You know, I feel like that's, like, um, kind of a lost thing right now, too, with some movies, you know, where, where you, you have a good movie, but then you, you put, like, maybe some new artist on there to kind of get them some, uh, you know, some buzz about them. You know, I know they yeah. still do move. They still do movie soundtracks with different bands, but I feel like you know that's kind of still a semi little bit of a lost art out there. Yeah, and also another other useful or kind of cool information about this was that they did record another song for this album that 
is it's kind of an it's a lost song like it was it, they lost the recording for it um and nobody knows what it was like they started recording another another song and also most of the drums on it are actually drum machine um interesting so dave holland did play on parts of the album but not most of it he was he was mostly mostly out of not out of the band because he did the tour but he it, he was mostly like gone he's like no they were kind of done with they ain't working for me brother all right but on the next album painkillers is also good it's in the 90s so we don't know about it yet but if anybody out there wants some time travel into the 90s and listen to painkiller that's a fucking great album too well we do have the uh, delorean for that so we do we have the delorean exactly the delorean is on the lights out so that's how we do the <laughs> That's how we do everything out of the 80s. Yes. <laughs> Just put some banana in that shit and we're good to go. And we're good to go. We can always travel into the 90s with the DeLorean. All right. Speaking of traveling, let's get this shit going with the new blood. Let's talk about who booked this shit. All yeah, right. tell me. I got to open my beer for this. Let me hear it. Yeah, brother. I like it. There we go. <laughs> I like All right. Sound. Who booked this shit, James? So it's a boy. So we have a new director again. I feel like every film mm. I'm saying that. I feel like okay. So every film we have a new director and we have a new final per- people. Like that's like a trope for Friday the Thirteenth. We just have to have new everything. So they calling this new yeah. blood. I was like, well, fuck. It's been new since part two. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it has it's been. Fucking You're new right. every fucking year. Okay. So we had this guy named John Carroll Butchler. I can't even say his name. Was it Butchler? That's what I assume it is, yeah. Yeah, Butchler. Uh, yeah. And Butchler, he, yeah. he did, like, the Troll series, okay? He did. He He's did. He's made, actually, good, quite a few good movies. Yeah, Curse of the 49er. All right, brother. I haven't seen that one. But I have seen Cellar Dweller, and he did the Ghoulies movies. Or I think he did Ghoulies 3. The yeah, Ghoulies 3. He did, um, he did yeah. A Nightmare on Elm Street for the Dream Master. There we go, brother. Well, well he did special effects on it. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. His makeup work includes Nightmare on Elm Street 4 and Halloween 4, The Return of Michael mm-hmm. Myers. This guy's done some uh, good shit. He, uh, oh, he also did From Beyond, too. That's interesting. We, nah, he did a bunch of retro blood classics over here, all in the archives, brother. Uh, yeah, yeah. He, yeah he, he's worked on a bunch of movies that we've done, and he worked on a bunch of movies that we're going to do. Yeah, so we'll, we'll be talking about him a lot more. But So his idea... For well, okay, so for, first of all, it was presented to him to make a Friday the 13th part seven, and his first reaction was like, oh, I don't know if I want to do that because who the fuck wants to make a seventh entry into a film series? That's crazy, <laughs> exactly. And I was thinking, like, well, well, yeah, so that's not, I don't think that's uncommon nowadays, but I can see how that was uncommon in the 80s because. You know, like we're saying, like the Friday the Thirteenth series, that's probably has to be the longest running horror franchise in the eighties. That were beginning in, in the eighties and doing from the eighties. I can't think of anything. Like I've been trying to do research. the 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 closest one I can think about that got close was the Amityville Horror, which we'll be doing later down the road. Those are the only well, ones. Most like, of those don't even count, though. Well, fuck. They be why not? They call, I can call, only think of four. Well, I think there's there's more than that too. Okay, but then I think that, I don't know. I think they all went straight to video. I don't know if that counts. Maybe it does. Maybe it does. Hey, Maybe it if should. it has the name in we'll it, we'll debate that later. All right. Okay, we're fine. just using the gimmick, brother. Um, it could be like the thing where you just slap the name on there. That has nothing to do with anything. <laughs> but I mean, honestly, though, most film franchises, regardless of what they are, don't really last long enough or not profitable long enough to make seven movies. Yeah. And they weren't even done at seven. I mean, we got more than this. Yeah, but that's crazy. like most of them, you know, because there's only five nightmares, right? There was nightmare one through five in the eighties. Yeah, there's no six in the eighties. Yeah, and then um, and then in modern times, we have the tenth Saul movie coming out. Yeah, so that, that most, counts now. Yeah, but most franchises just don't make it long enough to do. You know, they just don't do well enough to make make it that long. I mean, I think this is pretty remarkable that they were able to make this many. Yeah, within within one decade. Yeah, with, yeah, within one decade, yeah. So, which is cool. So, basically, what he wanted to do was he wanted to do something that hasn't been done before. Oh, boy. Where well, we heard that before. Uh, so, he yeah, that's why he idea. came up with the idea of, like, well, what if Jason actually had somebody who he couldn't beat? 
And I'm like, oh boy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> okay, so I think this idea is better than the one for part six, though. Oh yeah, well yeah. That may be a hot yeah. take. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah, well, I okay, we'll talk about the full movie, but I actually did think this movie was a lot more entertaining than number six. Okay, so there's a couple of things that was going on around this time as well too, of why he was making this whole decision like it was. So first of all, the new blood was intended to have a higher standard of quality, all right, than that of the previous <laughs> installments. They're putting more money into it basically. So Paramount's like, you know, this okay. always makes us money. How about we give them some money and see what they can do? I guess. Okay, but at first, Paramount Pictures wanted to set out a partnership with New Line Cinema to create a crossover film between Friday the 13th and Nightmare on Elm Street series. So they actually wanted to do that at this time. Okay, now obviously we later got that happening, you know, when we had Freddy vs. Jason, which we're going to be talking about on the lights out on Halloween, everybody. All right, but it's super interesting that they actually wanted to do that idea right now, but it's kind of like two wrestling promotions coming together. They couldn't figure out the creative. Okay. Yeah. Who are you going to put over, right? Exactly. So it just, uh, it just wasn't, uh, it just, it just wasn't happening at the time. So since that idea failed, okay, the screenwriter, Daryl Henley, he suggested that there's an idea between a Jason versus Carrie. You know, because remember Carrie, she had like psycho, <laughs> psycho fucking powers, brother. Because we don't want we don't want Freddy to fight and we don't want Jason to fight this awesome iconic character Freddy. No, we want him to fight Carrie. Jason versus Carrie. Holy shit. Yeah, brother. Okay. Fine. Sign me up, brother. That's fine. that sell out Madison Square Garden. That'll put the butts in the seats. Okay. So wow. that's how they kind of right. came. So my thing was though, so I want to ask you about this, Allison. Okay. Mm-hmm. So when you're watching this film, okay, did the carry? Let's say you didn't know about the whole carry shit and stuff. Like, <clears throat> did did you think? To me, I thought they're like, okay, well, we couldn't book Freddie because of the whole dispute of it creative not working. So what we're going to do is we're just going to give this fucking Tina char- character Freddy-like powers to fight Jason. That's what I thought watching it. That's that's actually what I thought when I watched it. Because I, I didn't yeah. know about that. I didn't know that they originally wanted to do you know, Jason versus Freddy at this time and just couldn't get New Line to play along. Yeah. So I thought that what they were, instead of the, her having, instead of like using Freddy's dream powers, they were just giving her like telekinetic powers. Yeah. You know what I mean? Where she could move shit with her and mind. And I was just but. thinking, like, okay, I, I, I remember seeing Carrie. Okay? That's a 70s film. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's a good film and everything, but did she use a lot of tele... I thought she only used that shit at the end. Or I could be wrong. I haven't seen it in a while. Um, It's been a very long time since I've seen it. Um, But, I mean, I know that she did use it some. Like, she slams doors and stuff with her mind. But not to the extent, like, I don't think she controls fire like she did it like uh, uh, Tina does in this movie. Um, but, but I mean, you know, it's 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 only loosely Carrie, right? It's just this girl who has these telekinetic powers that can beat Jason. But there's a lot of stuff in this movie that's very um, physically impossible, but we'll talk about that when we get there. Yeah, so there's a couple, like, different creative they were trying to figure out with this film. So apparently one of the concepts to Part 7 was conceived by an associate producer, Barbara, and was known as being similar to the plot of Jaws. All right? Wherein a corporation-led developer covers up the previous Jason Voorhees massacres in order to properly build condos on Crystal Lake. So that would have been, like, one of the concepts where, you know, (laughs) but the thing, it already happened. Like, we already had Pinehurst or whatever, you know, rebranding the Crystal Lake, so. True, that's kind of like that. I do like that idea, though, that there's all these, like, yuppies that are buying these condos on Crystal Lake, and, like, maybe they move from Florida or whatever, from, you know, Miami or South Florida, and then they buy up all this cheap land, and then they buy all the places so that nobody from up there can afford to live there anymore. And then Jason comes and kills all of them. I do like that concept. Yeah. So the executive producer, Frank, all right, we just talked about him before. You know, he's the guy, he's pretty much been attached to the 
Friday the Thirteenth series since it, since it came out. He didn't like that yeah. idea. But and then the screenwriter Daryl, he's the guy. Who's like, hey, well, you know, oh, well, you know, just imagine this booking meeting. Okay, this Daryl guy's like, all right, you got an idea about the Jaws? I get it. You know, build a bunch of condos. Jason comes up. What about this idea, guys? Okay, <laughs> you know, there's always some teenage girl in in fucking Friday Thirteenth movies. What if she had telekinesis powers, brother? Huh? Huh? Let's book I mean, it. I can let's, see how that would sell. Let's book it, brother. Things. But that Frank guy, we've talked about that Frank guy before. He's been trying to quit these movies for like the last two or three films. Yeah, but it, like, the I thing think is, he tried to quit after part three. Yeah, but hold on. He keeps coming back. So okay. so the thing is, okay, it's like it's like one of those things where like, no, no, I think he was big. He, no, no, I think, it, no, it was Paramount that didn't like the film, but he had a lot of influence. But I think he liked those films. Frank did. Okay. All right. But, so he was like the guy who like wanted to profit off most of the Friday films. Like he was, right. I think at this time okay. it was like, fuck the notoriety. I just want the money because they made a lot of, you know, money except this one didn't make jack shit. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, Apparently. supposedly they did. I mean, like they spent $2.8 million making this and it made $21 million. I mean, that's pretty good. Yeah. I mean, it's 10 times your money back. Yeah. Even though I got poor receptions and stuff, but you know, uh, I actually thought this yeah, one was a lot better than number six. So, Yep, um, six. So they basically went with the whole carry concept of like this 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 girl Tina having these powers and she'd be able to fight Jason equally, I guess. Equally, so, yeah. <laughs> but guess. um, so the the film's original working title was Birthday Bash. <laughs> the fuck? <laughs> well, that was just to hide it from being uh, for so they wouldn't know it was a Friday movie. That's true, probably. It was because movies do that a lot. Yeah, I know that. Yeah, and a lot of times they just give it a fake name so they won't know. And you had to People with this one know. because you know these these films are because we you know it's, it is interesting too that we actually did went one year without a Jason film because the last one we did yeah. was 1986. This is 1988, so we actually went one full year without no Jason film, brother. So obviously that was the you know working title to conceal its identity. So the entire production of this film was scheduled, complete, and released within a seven months. Shooting pl- take pl- took place from October to November of 1987 in uh, Baldwin County, Alabama, at uh, Barnes Lake off SR-225 yeah. in a nearby Mobile in February of 1988. John Allison, do you think that we saw Sp- Sparky Plug? Oh, I bet Sparky Plug was there. I'm surprised he wasn't even he wasn't in this movie. That's only for my wrestling fans. But that's uh, yeah, yeah. Sparky Plug, Alabama Slammer, Alabama Slammer, brother. So <laughs> we had to talk about this particular person. It's probably the guy who took Friday the Thirteenth and pretty much made it his own. I would say, like, if, when I think of Friday the Thirteenth actors, this guy definitely comes to mind first, which is crazy because he's on probably in three of the worst ones or like three of the most yeah. like interesting ones, I guess. It's Kane Hodder. Okay, so yeah. this is he, well, he. He's playing Jason at this time. Yeah, and, well, he embraced it more than anybody else, and also probably profited off of it more than anybody else. Oh, he had to, bro, because like this guy's been doing these horror movie cons since like I fucking liked horror movies. <laughs> like he's yeah, been. I mean, he's been doing it forever. Yeah, like I, 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 I know he's been in other stuff too, which is crazy. But like mainly, it's all Jason for him. It's all playing the Jason character. Yeah, he came out of um, the first thing I ever knew. Kane Hodder was in was actually a movie that uh, Butcher worked on as well, called Prison, which we're going to do on this show at some point. Yes, it was directed by Rennie Harlan. It was an early Rennie Harlan movie, but it's fucking fantastic. Yeah, that's what I heard. I, I, I haven't seen that prison movie before, but I have heard it's really good. And apparently, which I didn't know this either, but apparently Kane and the actor who played Nick, Kevin, Kevin Blair, they were mm-hmm. actually both on a film before this one as two. They were on the Hills of Eyes part two. Really? Uh, I guess Kane Hodder was probably doing was doing uh, some of the stunt work, I guess. Part. Yes. Yeah. So I thought that was really interesting, which would be doing that as well, too. So that's pretty cool. But yeah, like 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 I saying, like and you know, obviously he does play a really good Jason. Like the the J the the thing is like I guess at you know at this time we have the undead Frankenstein Jason. 
So he's not like the normal Jason we saw from like part three or four or anything like that. You know, no. like this is a completely different style of Jason. But I like we were saying before and during those reviews, this is probably the most popular style of Jason that people copy the most. The undead f- killing machine, Jason. Yeah, I guess it. I guess you're right. It is like people. I think when people think of Jason Voorhees, this is what they think of for some yeah. reason. Exactly, and they, no. and they they yeah, they retro they 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 retro actively put that on him too because because people when when you like if you had a conversation with somebody about Friday the Thirteenth Part Three, this in their mind this is the Jason they're thinking about, and Jason wasn't like this at all. No. In part Three, no, 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 he was uh, he was still a um, well, he was still technically alive, I guess. <laughs> okay, but he was definitely just yes. more like a uh, just a backwoods killer you know like a just a a killing machine he he wasn't an unstoppable killing machine he was just a a psycho crazed yeah older man serial killer guy yeah it was just a crazy hillbilly killing people yes but now he's a zombie yes and now we have jay now he's fighting carrie yeah all right but uh, actually i know like the thing is to me like i don't this might be uh i just didn't think this shit needed it the telekinesis crap. I didn't. That's the only part of this film I actually didn't really didn't like that much. You mean you would have liked it better if, it, if she was just a normal girl that was fighting the zombie Jason? Yeah, fuck it. I mean, why does she need powers? Like, why? Like the only thing I think it was the, just trying to add something different to it. Yeah, which I, I mean, I can I can respect. You know what I mean? I added some new shit in there, but like the only thing that you know. If, if 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 we're putting all of them together like they're all like you know part of the same universe okay i do like it where since this girl has those you know telekinetic powers you know that does you know lend its way to having the nightmare on elm street universe being the same you know what i mean because obviously there's some you know spiritual or like some like you know magic in those series nightmare on elm street with the freddy coming back from your nightmares and then, okay, I could see if something like that, then you can have somebody with telekinesis. Because I saw, didn't we have, didn't, wasn't the, 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 the Dream Tower or somebody had like that connection in Friday the 13th where they did t- telekinesis too? It's a fucking um, 80s thing. You mean in, uh, in Nightmare on Elm Street? Yeah, Nightmare on Elm Street, yeah. Yeah. Well, we had, um, the girl, <laughs> um, the leader of the Dream Warriors. Yeah, 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 yeah. Was connected to Freddy. Exactly. Yeah. Where was she? Why didn't she play Tina? All right. Exactly. They should have brought her back. They couldn't, brother. Like I beat, I beat Freddy. Now I'm gonna beat you too, Jason. It's the, it's See? the, cre- it's, the it's the creative man. They couldn't book it. All right. No. You're right. But you know, like I said, like there's, you know, this one, you know, it, like I said, it came out on Friday the Thirteenth. Okay, it got mostly negative reviews from critics. Okay, it grossed nineteen point two million, like we said, out of a two point eight budget. So it definitely made his movie. And one year later, we're gonna have Jason kill people in Manhattan. So you know, we're just moving along. But uh, it's interesting. There's a lot of interesting stuff about this movie. But Allison, if you're ready, if everybody is ready, I say let's get into the full review of Friday the Thirteenth. Part seven, the new blood. Let's let's do it. Let's do it. This is the one you've been waiting for. What's happening to me? Your psychokinesis and these delusions are. No, you're not listening to me. The one you've been asking for. Hey, <laughs> Tina, isn't this the way to weather jackets back in the mental hospital? <laughs> concentrate, concentrate, Tina. <laughs> You've been dying for. You people give me the creeps. Okay, you big hunk of a man, come and get me. Jason Ah! is back. But this time, someone is waiting. Friday 
the 13th, part 7, The New Blood. All right. <clears throat> so we start off the film with no, none other than a fucking recap, brother. It's yeah. back. The recaps are back. And I kind of like the, the the voice actor they had over the recap. He's really like sinister. He's like, yes, the, back in the, the woods over here, we have Jason. <laughs> it's a legendary tale. I was like, okay. And it was mostly just a recap of like uh, of Jason lives. Them coming yeah, back to life yeah. and shit with his little Batman belt on and shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's. I think it's kind of weird that they were still doing that because at this point, more people had home video and you most people could probably watch the old movies. Yeah. But also, I just can't imagine anyone would not know who. If you were, if this came out, I can't imagine but anybody would know not know who Jason Voorhees was. Yeah, but. like, I, I'm pretty sure when you get to number seven, I'm pretty sure they know who the characters are by now. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you, at, least the ma- so. at least the main character, okay? But they're also <laughs> probably padding the running time some, too, because, I mean, this movie is like, 88 minutes long with credits and the flashback. It's It barely has any time on running, yeah. running time on it. Well, you know, brother, we had to get that shit moving. All right. All right, so then we see, we finally cut to new scenes where we see a little girl named Tina, and she runs mm-hmm. out of her lake house after her... So, yeah. And I swear, I... Tell me if I heard this right, okay? So this girl, Tina, she runs out of her house after her dad slaps, has been slapping around her mom. That's what, yeah, he was He was kind of slapping her mom. That's yeah. kind of what it sounded They're like. beating her happening. ass like an abusive yeah. dad. And she's running out there, and she's like, goes into, she runs on her, like the pier, jumps on yeah. a boat, and then the dad, his dad's name's John, uh, yeah. like chases her down, and is like, hey, come back here. Did you see the mom chasing her? And she's all saying, I hate you, dad. I hate you, daddy. I wish you would die. And then we could see that, the, this lady, this girl has uh, 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 powers, and he, she, by her sheer will, her telekinetic powers, have <clears throat> destroyed the bridge that Dad was on, and he fell down into the to the river, and the whole river part fells on him, so he died. Into the lake, yeah, into the lake. the lake where Jason is. Yes, and they just happened to be in Crystal Lake at this time. We yeah, so this is like because we can't have lake houses anywhere two. else unless it's Crystal Lake. Nope. No, you would you would you would kind of question why people would still want to go vacation there, right? Well, you know, at this but, time, uh, Jason do. was just a legend, like our boy said <laughs> at the beginning. Well, okay, that's true, but it's only three months though after this happened. You know, I like though I like how in number um number six he was a legend, and then now number seven he's also a legend. So like what he's what. Also a legend. It, 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 like how? So we didn't really get like a time frame. So how long has Jason been on that water? <laughs> okay, three months. It hasn't been three the, months. The, the art, what I what the information that I have in front of me says that he was there for three months. Okay. Or huh. th- this scene that we're seeing right now takes place three months after, um, after um, Tommy puts him at the bottom of the lake. Okay. But then, but then we have the girl grow up. But then, <laughs> so we have another time. Right, so jump. now we got to talk about the timeline again, right? We got to talk about the timeline now. So now we have a, a flash forward for like ten years. And so I, we're, I say we're 10 almost years. like two thousand, aren't we? Boy, these people don't have any. That's thousand. what I was thinking. Where was their cell phone? That's what at? I was thinking. <laughs> I know that's what I was thinking. So because um, in the interview with uh, John Carl Butchler, he says that um, he's like, yeah, this movie takes place ten years after the last one. So, so yeah, so so when did we decide part six took place? Like 1992? Yeah, it was like 92 or something like that. So this this has been in 2002, brother. Yeah, so WCW is already gone. I know. know. Nobody has a cell phone, though, in this movie. I at least had like a cheap one at that time. You know what I mean? We got a DVD player. I had this time. All right. Maybe okay, so maybe so here's here so here's how it could take place in 2002. Um, so I would no. imagine in 2002 did in really the, remote areas. Did you see the in really hair? remote area? Hold on, hold on. I haven't got that far yet. In 2002, you probably didn't really have good cell phone signal in really remote places like that. So maybe they just left the cell phones at home. 
But when you look back at the uh, the mom's hair, well, everybody's hair in this whole movie, and then uh, the Lincoln Town Car or the Oldsmobile that they were driving, like they were driving a really fucking old car. So what you so what you're telling me is rich people who can afford a lake house are poor. Maybe they just spent all the money on the lake house. That's true. And that's why they have to drive a 1988 Oldsmobile. Maybe it's vintage day. <laughs> well, anyway. So yeah, Tina, it's a she, retro, it's a retro car. Well, she wasn't, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the retro hair, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Go to the lake house, retro day, no problem. So Tina, she's all grown up now. Now she's going back to Crystal Lake, where it all happened of her killing her dad. Okay, and she's upset about it, yeah. which we'll talk about here in a little bit. And she's going to be meeting Doctor Cruz. So apparently, Tina, yes. after she supposedly killed her dad from psycho. A psycho from telekinetic powers she has been yeah. instituted in a psych ward and her main dr cruz is now having her come out to crystal lake to overcome her 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 pain of killing her mm-hmm. dad there to see if she can live in a normal world and of course cruz is not up to any good of course nope and dr cruz is played by the great terry kaiser who you may know from his greatest role of all time as Bernie. Yeah, buddy. Bernie, bro. For the Weekend of Bernie's. Yeah. Play, in Weekend of Bernie's, Weekend of Bernie's 2. Those are, he played Bernie. Those are both great movies. They are great movies. He was good in this film, too. As the uh, yep. semi-evil doctor. So Tina, so now they all get to the house. They see Cruz. And then we also see there's, there's a chorus right next door. There's, of course, Young Kids. And these young kids are there because there's this guy named Michael who's going to have a surprise birthday. And there's this guy named Russell who so, so happens to have his uncle letting him use his beach house or lake house for the, for the weekend. Well, yeah, you got to have that rich friend that'll let you use the yeah. beach house, right? Yeah, down. The lake house. So, so now we have this guy, Nick. She, he comes over to uh, for Tina and you can see that they're flirting a little bit and he grabs her panties. And he gets all embarrassed. All right. Well, now, to be fair, he's trying to help her pick up her clothes. Yeah, and her panties fell out. Yeah, and her panties fell out. He could have done some fancy line like, hey, how are these going to look on my floor? (laughs) There you go, right there, brother. Yeah. Well, it's in the moment, right? (laughs) He didn't have time to think about it. So now we see Cruz. He is trying to have Tina use his powers. And all I could think was, is this fucking X-Men? Like, what am I watching here? You know That's I mean? kind of what I thought. It was a lot like uh, Jason versus uh, Jean Grey. Yeah, Jean Grey, yeah. X-Men. And we have, we have Cruz being uh, Professor X, Charles Xavier, yeah. teaching her how to use her powers, brother. <laughs> so, and then basically the, the, the doctor is saying, like, he's getting mad because Tina won't move the matches. And he's saying, like, well, I got to get you all pissed off, basically. So he, he's seeing that she, she can so only he, use her powers if she's, like, angry or in, like, one of those, like, angry state of minds. Yeah, so then he just screams at her. Yeah. And then... Until she moves him. She moves him, and then he pisses her off some more, and he's like, I'm just trying to help you get over your, your guilt. And she's like, no, you're lying. And then she, the whole match is burn up. Which he, he is, is lying. lying yes, he is lying. Yeah, brother. It's 80s, brother. Of course they're lying. All right. So now we have... This is when we meet a quick scene that we see... Um, we see Russell, okay, and his uh, his girlfriend... Over here. Is it Sandra? I believe it is Sandra, yes. That's what I was saying. Because he's... uh, Yeah, she was the one that was hired to be naked yeah. in the movie. Yeah, yeah. So we see a quick little quick little sex scene of Russell and Sandra. All right, and they're talking about... And this is when Russell says, my uncle... like he base, It's Russell's uncle's lake house that they're in. To have mm-hmm. a surprise party for this character named Michael, which we haven't met yet. Which I'm pretty sure they were taking that from Michael Myers. Don't think they weren't. I wondered. I wondered that as well if that was the case. I'm pretty sure they were. So now Tina is now seeing a. So this part was a little weird. Okay. So now we see that Tina sees a picture of her dad, right? Mm. So and she's upset about her dad, and then she's like, "Oh, I miss him." To his mom, it's like, oh, "I miss him too." And I'm just like, well, "Hold on a second. Didn't we just see this guy in the beginning see him slapping you around and shit? Like, you're sad about this abusive husband? Well, I mean, 
I just I thought that was kind of weird too. But you know, I mean, not everything in the world is black and white. Like That's sometimes true. there's gray areas for things, and you know, yeah. um, maybe he just uh, I don't know. maybe just a a bad character, a bad you know character of judgment at the time. I don't know. It's just kind of weird. I mean, maybe, but it, I think it is odd. I think it is odd that the dad was betrayed as so abusive at the beginning. Yeah, because I, I swear you know she I mean? said, like, like, oh, you're slapping mommy again. I was like, damn, again? <laughs> yeah, like, again, yeah, like yeah I, agree, I completely agree with that. I, I, fa- I found that a little bit distasteful myself. Like, I feel like he was betrayed as a bad guy. And then, but then and at the very beginning, like a really bad guy. But then for the rest of the movie, he's kind of portrayed as just a normal dad. Yeah, or like. When they talk about him. Yeah, and things. exactly. So I don't know. I, I thought that was really weird. Yeah, because it looks like they it looks like they were gonna put some heat on maybe like the dad, but then they put all the mm-hmm. heat basically on the on the doctor Cruz, because Cruz shows up and then Tina gets all pissed off again and then she runs outside, and then she's having some flashbacks of killing her dad and this is when she uses her powers to locate something that's in the lake and of course that's breaking Jason from the water out of his chains, so that's how we get Jason back in action. We had this girl with her so, telekinetic powers unleashing yeah. his chain. So she, so okay, so hold hold the phone for a second. So, uh-huh. so they from after part six. Yeah, Jason's in the lake. Yep, and then at the end of part, he's chained in the bottom of the lake, and then we but we see his eye open, right? So he's conscious. Yes, and then three months after that is when all of this happens. With her, with Tina killing her dad, and he falls in the lake. Yes. Then 10 years later, so she's like supposed to be, I guess, like 18 or something now. Um, she, um, she, um, comes back to the lake house and then she awakens. She, she, she gets Jason out of his chains with her mind. Yeah, because she can do that, right? She can move things with her mind. So has is has Jason been conscious underneath the lake for ten years, just hanging out there? Yeah, I mean, maybe he's in dormant status. You know and he mean? can't find any way to get out of these chains no. in ten years. No man, like uh, see see when um, when our boy Tommy put those <laughs> chains on him, he also had some magic powers too. Where he put a, a, a spell on it, and the only person who could break this spell was uh, somebody with telekinetic powers. Oh, I see. Okay, I see. So you're, I, just, I not, just, you're just not that. getting. You're just not getting it, Allison. You got to expand I'm not your mind. The full picture. Yeah, I'm not. I'm, I'm just. I'm not smart enough for this. Right. My I, thing I was like, okay, so. So what we're led to believe was she felt a presence in the lake, and then she thought it might be her daddy. So now she's going to use that her powers sense. that she barely knows how to use to raise the person from the lake that she has a presence with. It just so happens to be the killer, Jason. Well, does it? Okay, so she does. Is it this? I don't know if it's this point or a little bit later in the movie. She does say, I wish I could bring you back to life. Yeah, that's her point of trying to get her dad's essence zombie-like body up there. I guess. Except. She doesn't have powers like that. She can just move things with her mind. That's it. Well, you know. And apparently a control see, fire. But. She does have this power. It was booked for this scene, so that's how she has them. All right, fine. So anyway, so, <laughs> she, so I guess Jason is dormant, and he's asleep, and then she brings him. Yeah, he's, it's kind of like, you know what I mean? It's kind of like when you go to one of those hyper, you know, those those hyper chambers. You know, you're in space. Mm, you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I guess he does that later. So. He does that later, too. <laughs> <laughs> So Jason gets out, she sees him, and she basically just passes out. Okay. Yes. And then she wakes up in her in her house, and she's like, when she sees the mom and the crews, and she's like, "Hey, you know, did you guys see? I saw a man." She's like, "Oh, what do you mean a man?" And basically, Cruz just thinks that that Tina right now is having delusions. She's making delusions mm-hmm. in in her brain. She's saying hallucinations because of all the guilt she's having around the place that she killed her daddy. Yes. All right. And then we cut, and then we actually have a scene that I was happy to see. We have a car breaking down. So that, oh, that's yeah, back. Finally. It's finally. It's back. I missed it. You know, we went two years without, yeah. you know, we, we Jason lived. No big car broke down. It's like, why not? Let's keep it going. I know. Maybe they didn't get close enough to the lake. 
That's true. Maybe because well, if you get close to the lake, your car they're breaks around down the every fucking time. lake. They had the fucking well, camp true, blood were. sign under there. Yeah, I'm just trying to find some kayfabe reason that this happened, but I don't know. But but now we got uh, it back again. So now these kids. So this is when we meet Jane and Michael. So Michael is the guy we we're talking about who's having the surprise birthday, and his girlfriend Jane's the one who planned it. Okay, mm-hmm. and she's like, "Well, I had a surprise birthday for you, but now it's all ruined and shit." And his his. I have questions about this scene too. Well, but go ahead. We'll get there. Okay. All right. So, um, so now, so now, Nick. Okay. So Nick is is Michael's like cousin. Okay. Mm-hmm. And he's there at the lake house, um, to to you know to celebrate with everybody. And so Nick goes to Tina, and now he invites Tina to the party. And Tina, you know, at first she was a little bit, you know didn't know she should go but the mom's like yeah yeah go out there and then Cruz is like oh he's not liking that idea but then like the mom's like well you know mom's like well we're trying to get her to back to being sociable again you know this would be a great Mm -hmm. idea he's like yes of course of course not at all what we're trying to do yes no that's not what he's trying to do brother that's what he's trying to do right exactly yes so now we have so what part do you is it this part where jane and michael are walking in the woods and jason's right behind them yes yes so my question about this is so the car, I get this part. The car breaks down, yeah. and they're going to the to their cabin because it's his surprise birthday party, right? Yes. But my question though is, and she says we're almost there, but he wants, to, and they should walk, but he wants to sleep in the woods. Yeah, it's lazy. Why? Why would you, if you were almost there and you could sleep indoors, why would you sleep in the woods by your broken down car? I can perfectly answer you with one question. Yes. Sex in the woods, brother. Well, maybe. Because our boy Michael is like, listen, you know, this girl Jane, she prom- she promised you this party. Apparently, we found out later this Michael guy is a partier. Like, he smells parties and just goes to them. Okay? <laughs> that was a line used. <laughs> so, maybe his plan was, like, yeah. okay, you know, I'm going to sleep in the woods. I'm going to fuck mm-hmm. this girl and I'm going to go to the party. All right? But, first, I got to go drain my lizard. Okay, and of course, by mm-hmm. going pissing and shit, this is when Jason sneaks up behind him and kills his ass. Yeah, so there no goes more Michael. Him. No more Michael. All right, and then Jason goes up into Jane and he kills her ass too. And he stabs her. Yeah. So these people <laughs> essentially were created just to have two more people for Jason to kill. Yeah. Well, actually, Jason because they contribute nothing really yeah. to the movie. And I got it backwards. Sorry, Jason stabbed Jane. Threw a tree in her neck yeah. first, and then Mike sees it. He runs away, but then Jason kills him with a knife. He, he like throws like a fucking knife at him. Mm-hmm. It's a pretty cool scene or too. It's, like it's it's a spike in it. Yeah, spike. Like a spike. Yeah, like steak like, or something. Yeah, it's kind of like a steel like a spike on there, and he, and he stabs him with it. But then he comes and stabs him again. And which is cool he, about yeah. this is like the deleted scenes. Like you actually can like in this movie he would do it and then like just cut. But the deleted scenes, you can actually see the whole thing like, go through. Like a lot of the kills would go through. Yeah, I wish they had uh, not edited this out. It would have been it would have been much better. Yeah. So the apparently, for the time great. period, this is too gory for like a high budget movie like this. You know, nowadays, they're, like they they were even saying this too. Like nowadays, there would have been nothing. But you know, back in the eighties, for a high budget movies, they couldn't do as much gory death scenes like they can nowadays. I mean, that's kind of true. But now, if they did that now, it would be total like uh, it would it would be all CG. So Not necessarily, bro. That new Saw movie, that fucking brain scene. Well, fuck, <laughs> that shit was crazy. Yeah, the new bro. Saw movie is supposed to have mostly <laughs> practical effects. Yeah. But like um, the. Uh, but that's that's the problem you have though when you're making these kind of movies, right? So now by this point, Friday the Thirteenth is mainstream. Yeah, they're not underground like former porno directors making movies. So you can get away, like like in 1988, they couldn't have made the Friday the Thirteenth Part One at that point or Part Two. Like the things that they were doing then, they couldn't do anymore because it was mainstream and it was a conservative time and people were just more were more shocked by things like that so they got edited out because if you think about it i mean friday 30 part one is way more graphic than these last two movies we watched oh yeah definitely oh yeah yeah definitely definitely um so now we're back at the party all right and we meet mm-hmm. eddie 
he is some sort of like nerdy screenwriter guy. And then we, you're basically just me and all the kids right now. So then we cut, we see the redhead. Her name is Robin. All right. Then we see this nerd girl. Her name is Maddie. And they both yeah. like this guy, David, who is like some like kid Fonz stoner guy. All right. Kind of, yeah. And then we have uh, 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 Russell. All right, and Sandra, they show up, and Russell's all mad about the fucking kids partying in his uncle's house and eating their food and everything. Uncle's going to be all pissed off. Then we meet Melissa, and she's talking about her fucking jewelry. There are pearls on there. And she's also, like, being really jealous and very being very mean to Tina out there, too. So we're, we're getting some drama, brother. Drama has returned to the Retro Blade podcast. Yeah, we got a lot of people in this. A lot of victims introduced in this movie. Exactly. And then while some of the kids are talking, Tina just randomly has a flash of Jason killing Michael. And she drops her drink and she just runs out of there. Runs all the way to the house. Sees a little spike. Saw that little spike that killed um, Michael. She sees that like at her house. She runs in. Mm -hmm. She tells their mom. It tells Cruz about it. Tells them to come outside and see the spike and everything. They go out there. They don't see anything. And now Cruz is still thinking that she's seeing, you know, delusions. She's having hallucinations. She's hallucinating everything. And now she kind of believes it herself, uh, Tina is. She's, like, getting kind of worried because she thinks she's just saying things. She thinks she might be this place. So she's, like, getting kind of worried. And then, of course, Cruz also looks on worried. Like he's up to something. Because he is. Yes. So, this is a random scene. <laughs> so, I'm not really sure who these characters were. They, I don't think they were part of uh, Michael and Nick's whole group and shit. So, we just had this girl and this guy camping. Okay? And uh, the girl is cold. And our boy is like, well, let's just crawl into the sack. All right? And she's like, well, go get some firewood first. He's like, okay, it's going to be a, a, a cold night. Okay, so he leaves to go get some uh, some firewood. All right. And then this guy, his, his name is Dan. Okay. And he grabs perfectly chopped wood for his fireplace mm-hmm. out there in the wild. So here's another complaint I had about this. So he, he goes to the woods to get some wood for the fire with a machete, which nobody, you cannot possibly chop wood with a machete. That's It, it is not possible. No one who made this movie has ever been out in the woods. Well, maybe he had a really good grip that. strength. Maybe. Yeah, maybe he had a magical machete. He used, he used his mind to chop it up. But yeah, he hits the end of this perfectly pre-cut piece of wood, and then it falls <laughs> off. <laughs> and then he picks them all up, and they're perfectly cut. Yep. And then he goes back toward the... Uh, He's walking back toward the cab or the yeah. tent. And then Jason comes up behind him and stabs his ass in the fucking back. Yep. And of course, they're back at the tent. Girl's already in the fucking. Uh, she's already in the sleeping bag, writing for some sex. Mm. And she's all like, "Come here, you big hunk of man. Come get it." And I was like, "Let's do it, brother. Get me all in there. Tag me in." But, so, but, but I don't know. Have you ever had sex in a sleeping bag? I assume it kind of suck, I guess, but I mean... I would think so, too. I've never done it, but it seems like it would just be hard move to move around. around guess, right but... Yeah, right. So, uh, you know, but anyway, I guess that's what their plan is. So, the this, the tent's being shaken. She's getting kind of worried. And she yeah. goes, she's like looking down, and then Jason uses his machete now that he recently got to cut the tent. All right, and he gla- grabs the girl in the sleeping bag <laughs> and knocks her ass against a tree and kills her. <laughs> And which would as I was gonna say that's another good scene yeah. that's the unedited version is better where he hits her multiple times yeah. on the tree. And it's pretty interesting how they did that too. Where, you know, they cut it where the, the sleeping bag had just a bunch of like bags of blood in it. And he would yeah. it would knock it against the tree that had razor blades to show like the like the blood being spattered. And apparently the bag was super hard to like do. So Kane was like had to do it like so many times that he was getting pissed off about it, and that's why it looked really good. And he's also saying too that Kane did it. He said that this was his favorite kill that he ever did was a sleeping bag scene, which it was. It was a pretty it, creative idea. 
Yeah, I thought it was shot really well too. Because when he grabs her, when Kane Hodder grabs her, the actress, and, and he, she's actually in that sleeping bag. You can just tell the way she's moving; it's a real person. And he just like grabs her and drags her ass out of the out of the tent, and then she's like moving around inside there. And then they make a really smooth cut to where it moves from the actress in the sleeping bag to whatever they put into it. You know what I mean? Yeah. The this the bags of blood. So it like it it, it was a it was really smooth. Like they didn't really have to cut away from it very long or anything. So I thought it looked really good. I thought this scene was done really well. Yes. So now we're back at the now we're back at the house, the kids' house, and it's the morning time. Okay. And we have uh, Eddie. Uh, they're talking about some films and stuff. And then we actually have two new characters showing up. We have Ben and Kate. Okay. And they were, they're basically, they don't really understand where Mike was. They think, so Ben just thinks that Mike got pulled over for drinking and driving and spent a night in jail because there's not a party he would sniff and not go to. That's an exact mm-hmm. line. <laughs> All right. And uh, so now we have Melissa. She's there. She's asking, where's Nick at? And then Robin said, oh, Nick, oh, he's with that Marilyn monster girl. Okay. okay. <laughs> so now we have Nick and Tina. They talk by the lake. And she's like, oh, I, I guess your friends don't really like me too much. And Nick's like, they ain't my friends. <laughs> it's like, they're just my cousin's I mean, friends. <laughs> did he call her a Marilyn Munster just because she's blonde? No, it's because she was like freaking out or something. I have no idea. <laughs> okay. Because, I mean, Marilyn Munster was like the... The monster's girl, the, the the cousin that they thought was ugly, but she was beautiful. Yes. And, you know, it just, I don't know. It's, it's weird. It's, I don't know, it's, it's one of those thing. 80s weird, things, weird brother. Things. We're, we're going to yeah, insult so. you in right. strange ways. Okay. <laughs> hey, she did something strange. Let's insult her. She dropped a beer and ran away. Oh, she's a crazy one. <laughs> it's also weird that that beer broke, too. Yeah, yeah, on the carpet. She yeah. dropped it on the carpet. Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> that's like the worst beer bottle I've ever what seen. What kind of fucking beer bottle was that? <laughs> <laughs> Some of this shit doesn't even break over my head. How the hell is it going to break on a carpet? I know, I know, I know. So she's out there. Uh, Tina's talking to uh, to Nick about it, about them not being friends. And now we have to give the backstory. So Nick's like, okay, yeah, my backstory is basically I'm from Pittsburgh. I ran with a bad crowd. <laughs> And now I'm doing my life better now here. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, well, I killed my dad at the lake right over there. <laughs> I'll do you one better. Yeah. I was a troubled kid. Well, yeah. I murdered my dad at the lake right over there, right yeah. where we are right now. And he's all like, oh, well, shit. You got me shit. beat. Mm-hmm. And then the whole time, Melissa, she's watching because she's jealous. And then Tina's like, listen, listen, my- Nick, you don't want to mess with me. All right. My head's all messed yeah. up and shit. All right, and and I'm here with my doctor, and I'm from a mental hospital. So Melissa's hearing all this stuff. All right, and then they hear some stuff in the woods sneaking around. They stop for a little bit, and then Nick flirts with her. He's like, "Don't worry about it. I see stuff too. I see a pink elephant." And they're like, "Oh, ha ha, we're laughing." And they start kissing. How funny! And I'm like, "Is this easy?" Shit. Okay. So now we have uh, uh, Tina. She's all happy around the mom stuff because she just got herself a boyfriend, this Nick guy. And then Cruz mm-hmm. is she's not so. Every time she sees him, she's not happy at all. So we have all the kids. They're playing outside. They're all talking about you know Mike not being here for his own party and stuff, and they're just gonna have fun without him. Uh, Tina, she's now looking for Nick, and Melissa is making some jealous stuff about her. Uh, and then now we have that Maddie girl, the nerd girl. She thinks Dave is going to like her, but Robin's like, he's not going to like you. He's not in your league. And guess what? I'm going to go smoke some weed. And then we have this whole like PA segment. She's like, you're going to go smoke some weed? She's like, yes. Yes, Maddie. I promised <laughs> out here I, I would do what we got to do and have fun, and I'm going to go smoke some weed. And I was just thinking, you know what? It was not only two m- movies earlier than this. The motherfuckers were doing cocaine. So you bitch smoking yeah, weed, that doesn't yeah. matter. Okay, go go talk to my boy, a fucking Billy from from number one, and see if this fuck for number five, and see if the fucking weed's gonna do anything. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, don't you think? I mean, do you think that that's like kind of how times were changing a yeah. little bit? Like you know, like you know, like for the first here, like too. five movies, they're like they're like smoking weed, they're doing coke, they're yeah. drinking everywhere, and then now they're like 
I am going to smoke the marijuana. Yes, you know, I am like, going to smoke. Like, <laughs> I'm going to have this guy. I'm going to smoke the marijuana. I'm going to do some nasty sex with him. Okay. I got you, girl. Go ahead. Do your but thing. She's, she's, well, she's doing it so that, you know, that he'll like her or whatever, but. Yeah, know. well, just, you know, so Robin, so bo- both of them are like, they're friends, right? There's Robin and Maddie girl, yeah. but they're both smitten with this David guy. I don't know why. He looks <laughs> like a fucking nerd to me. All right, but, and, but basically. And one Rob- thing I thought was, I was going to say, yeah. one thing I thought was funny is the Maddie girl, the nerdy girl is wearing those like huge, like round 80s nerdy glasses like all yeah. the girls are wearing now. Yeah. So like, I don't know. That's and her hair is fucking out. The, bro, these... Oh yeah, Maddie and the mom's hair were just out of control. <laughs> it's fucking eighties <laughs> spectacular. Okay, in two thousand and two, apparently. It's in two thousand and two, yes. yeah. So now, so now Melissa, she's like fucking with Eddie now. Okay, so she's, yeah. she's she's basically trying to fuck with Eddie. All right, and then now she's making a joke. So she basically she takes Eddie's jacket and turns it around. And then she, she, in front of everybody, says, Hey, Tina, is this how they wear it at the mental asylum that you're in? Ha, ha, ha. Mm-hmm. Everybody starts laughing. Mm-hmm. All right. And then Tina gets all pissed off. So she chokes the bitch with her fucking pearl necklaces and, and drops it. And then she runs out of there. And they're all like, what the fuck just happened? <laughs> so. And then mm-hmm. Nick finally shows up. Fucking missed it, brother. And then, of course, Tina goes back home. Now she hates the place. Uh, she said, I almost killed this girl. Uh, Cruz thinks everything, you know, it's, it's all ties together of, of her guilt and everything's making her do this, but she just wants to leave. So our girl Tina just wants to leave and get out of there, saying this place is changing her. I'm like, well, all you did was fucking choke the bitch. I mean, what? I, I, I think they need to do, like, a little bit more of her, you know, acting a little more stranger, but she acted like the whole place <clears throat> is changing her. Well, yeah, but I mean, it could just be that she's, um, you know, kind of wor- like, because m- maybe like, I feel like she feels like she was safer before she came there. And now everything just seems really weird. And I got fucked you. up. So they're arguing and Cruz is, you know, trying to get her to stay and stuff. But she eventually gets pissed off and throws a TV at her with her mind. Mm-hmm. And then she runs away and she actually runs into Nick and Nick's apologizing for Melissa, and she's like, "I don't care about all that." And I was like, what? "Okay." And she says, "Like, um, she's like, something's very wrong here, all right." And I'm seeing things in this place. And hey, do you got a pick of that Mike guy? He's like, "Yeah, I do." He's like, "I think I think he's dead." <laughs> okay. And he's like, and then the mom comes. We're leaving in the morning, and that's it. And then and Mike's like, and then Nick was sitting there like, "Okay, what just happened?" <laughs> so. This is a cool scene, and I'm glad, I'm glad we brought this style of scene back. So we have our boy Russell and Sandra, and they're about to do some skinny dipping, brother. It's back. It's All right. back. I know. That is one thing I'm glad they added back, because they hired this girl to be just to be naked in the movie, and yeah. that's pretty much what she does. Yeah. Shows up naked, does her <clears> thing. <throat> so I do like this. So Russell, I was like, well, so uh, when did you know you loved me? And Sandra's like, well, I've always loved your big fat wallet. <laughs> yeah. Because he's rich. I'm only dating you because you're rich. Yes. Okay. And so she gets butt ass naked. All right. She jumps into the fucking lake. I'm like, yeah, buddy, let's do yeah. it. And Russell's like, okay, I'm going to get me some of that shit. So he's starting to take off his clothes, and Jason just sneaks up right behind him because he's a cock yeah. block. All right. <laughs> 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 Hot flag and Jason <laughs> takes the fucking knife, stabs his ass. Sandra like gets, she dips in the water. She's then she sees Russell dead on the floor. She freaks out, and then Jason, who was underwater for about what? Well, how many years? Like almost 10, 12 years, just gets mm, right back yeah. into the water, and <laughs> right, not scared of it at all. Okay, gets well, right back into the water yes, and grabs her down. Yes, yes, but here's <clears throat> here's another issue I have with this. This lake that they're in yeah. must have the steepest drop off of any lake in the world. Oh yeah, I know, right? Because they're only like she's only like just a very few feet from the shore. Yeah, that's but like it's down. it's deep enough that she can't touch the bottom, and it's also so deep that Jason can go down underneath her and yeah. then pull her down even further. I mean, like how deep is this lake? Like three feet from the shore, it just drops off like fifteen feet or something. Well, yeah, brother. Or you know, that. it's you know, it's for flooding issues. <laughs> 
Okay. It's like a bottomless uh, lake. Yes. All right. But, you know, w- but when we get down there, though, on the lake, we can perfectly see the sign Camp Blood. So when we get down there. Yeah. Oh, it's, it also has the clearest water in the world. Yes. Like, you can see the Camp Blood, uh, le- the... Um, I don't know if you ever swam in the lake, but they're definitely not that clear. But you can see this Camp Blood sign. And I thought that scene was actually shot really well where the camera is underneath her. Yeah. And she's like kind of swimming in the water naked. Yeah. Like, you it, see that everything. Was beautiful. Like, that just looked really good. For an 18 to 34 male, perfect scene, brother. Loved it. Well, not just for that, but I mean, that didn't hurt. But I mean, I just thought it looked beautiful the way the light was in the water. It just looked good. Great. So, great scene. Yes. So now we have. Eddie, he's talking about King Tut now because he's our residential nerd. All right. And then we have yeah. Dan and Robin. They're dancing. They're about to be fucking. And then Maddie's upset. And then Robin basically tells her to, like, make herself better. Like, I need you to... You got to up your game. And she's like, okay, well, I will. So so now we have Ben and Kate. So apparently the Ben and Kate character, they were, like, fighting. And then they just made up. Mm-hmm. That's it. To make to have some sex. Okay. To have sex. Mm-hmm. Their character was literally okay, one scene we're gonna talk about Mike, one scene we're fighting, one scene we make up, and one scene we're having sex. And then we die. Yep. And then we die. <laughs> I mean, I would love to be in these movies. I mean, you don't have to do jack shit, brother. You just show up not, not at this point. Smoke weed, do some coke, and fuck. And then you get paid for it. I mean, the only the only people we know anything about in this entire movie, yeah. we know that Russell's rich. Yes. We know that Sandra's fucking Russell because he's rich. Yes. We know about Nick. Yes. Um, we know about. Wait, Eddie's the nerd. Eddie's the nerd. He, the right. guy that writes the movies. We Robin know that. and we Maddie. Know the girl. We know that. Robin and Maddie want to fuck the same guy. That's the only thing we know, though. We don't know. Anything. We don't. Only thing we know about those people is they want to fuck the guy. Well, that what's there more weed. than now? Well, the other movies have more. They tell us more about the characters. I'm just all I'm saying is that they just wrote a bunch of characters in so Jason could have a bunch of people to kill. You know, I'm fine with that. You know, if we want to add some 80s kids in here to fucking get killed, you know what I mean? (laughs) It is what it is. Okay. Okay, fine. So now, Maddie, she's putting on her makeup. Okay. Yeah. And then I guess Jason takes Sandra out of the lake. So uh, yeah. now Nick, he's looking for Mike all around. He's trying to call up Mike because, you know, with the warning that Tina gave him. Uh, Melissa's mm. trying oh. to flirt with him. Oh, go ahead. Will you say something? I was going to say that was a really cool scene too, where he's dragging. Um, which I'm pretty sure that was also a real a, a real actress. Yeah, that Kane Hodder was dragging naked out of the lake. I thought that looked really good too. Yeah, that was a cool scene. So now Melissa's trying to flirt with Nick. All right, and she's trying to make him jealous by now. Melissa's trying to flirt hardcore with Eddie. Okay, saying how she's always thought Eddie was cute and everything. Yeah. Even though fucking Nick, he wasn't even looking at her, caring at all. But she, I guess Melissa mm-hmm. is so conceited of herself that she thinks he was. Mm-hmm. So now we have, um, so we do have a scene of Cruz, and we found out that Cruz had the spear this whole time and was hiding it from everybody. Okay. So apparently uh, he out, went out to the woods and he found it off the dead Mike. All right. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. So, all right. Now, all right. I, all right. That makes sense. So, I was going to ask you the question. So, Cruz put it in. Well, okay. That still doesn't make any sense. So, when he stuck it in the house, yeah. How did how did it go away? Well, okay. Because he was in the house when it happened. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure the time frame of this. I can't tell that he. I couldn't tell if if Cruz found the spear on dead Mike when he's out in the woods, or he saw it on the side of the house. Were, were Tina solid, or maybe she was imagining? Are you sure he didn't it. just find it in the woods? Well, no, they showed a scene of him finding it on near near the dead Mike. So, and he grabs it. Yeah. All right. Oh, you're right. You're right. Yeah. And when he he gets, yeah, you're right. He he finds Mike's body. Yeah, um, but I'm guessing. So then how? I'm, no, the only thing I could think of is the one that Tina saw was in her imagination, but she was she can see that kind of stuff. Okay, maybe. Because, see, the reason I thought I didn't think that was because I was under the impression, because she put her hand on it, like she's looking at the indention where it was. Yeah. But maybe there's no indention. Maybe you're right. Maybe she's just like, am I, because that's why she would say, am I crazy? Yeah. But, there, that, but would, okay, really, that would make sense. But there really was a spike the whole time. 
There was, yeah, it was in Michael, yeah. So, so after this, um, the the mom goes into that same room that Cruz was to try to find him and, and Tina and stuff, and she goes to the desk. She reads a letter, all right, and then we see Cruz. This is you know we see the whole Cruz grabbing the spike, and then yeah. the mom pulls out a VHS and she plays the VHS. It's about the Anderson case. All right, and this we can see that Cruz, his whole plot was to harness Tina's powers. And then now the mom is pissed off because he thought Cruz just wanted to help her and get her back into the society and be a normal girl. But our boy Cruz was basically Magneto and he wanted to harness Tina's powers for his own gain. Yeah, he was trying to start his own X-Men. So basically the X-Men have joined... Friday the 13th. I got it. Yeah. So Cruz comes in and he's like going back and forth with the mom. Mom's super pissed off at him now because you can see it through all the lies. And he's trying to basically save face saying, you just don't understand this, this treatment. I had to bring her back here for this treatment. She's like, you only brought her back here so you can see her powers. Okay. Oof. And then Tina hears all this. She gets pissed off. She grows in the car and she gets the fuck out of there. All right, so she's driving on the road. She sees a a flash of Jason killing her mom. So she gets off on the side of the road. And then she gets out of there and she runs away. All right. You know that girl, Maddie? She finishes Mm -hmm. putting on her makeup. Oh, okay. Finally. And she walks outside randomly where nobody's at. And she calls for Dave. Even though she should (laughs) have known Dave is fucking her friend. I guess she just wasn't getting the Yeah, because they talked about that. So she dropped her earring. Okay, so this is kind of weird. So they actually made two different scenes. I actually thought the 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 cut scene was a lot better than this scene that we get. So in the in in, in this scene, she's out in the woods just calling for Dave. She drops her earring, she gets up, and then we see Russell's dead body fall from a tree, and that's where she runs to the cabin. Okay? Mm-hmm. But in the in the cut scene that they 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 get out of the movie, I thought it was a lot better where she goes to the, the, the part of the cabin and she sees Robin and Dave fucking with each other, like smoking and drinking, and she's getting jealous and they make fun of her a little bit and they give her the weed smoke and then they leave and then she's smoking the weed then Jason comes in and gets her. So I thought that made more, a lot more sense than this one because, like, why the fuck did she get all ready and just randomly walking outside for no reason? So. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So she's in there now. She's she's hiding from Jason. Jason's like walking around. We get that scene where, you know, hiding and back and forth. She eventually crawls out from the space on a wall. Jason grabs like a hook. And then he fucking uh, uh, busts through the wall, grabs her and hooks her. But we don't see the death scene. And apparently they had some yeah. sort of like crazy death scene for her in like the cut version. But they weren't able to show it because of, uh, you know, ratings, brother. Censorship. Censorship. Boo. So. And he, he hooked that girl. So she's all out of there. So now we have Tina. She's like running and then she eventually finds, runs in the Nick, of course. And she's basically saying how she has to find her mom and Cruz. And, uh, they, you know, and then the mom and Cruz find the Tina's car. All right. So they all run off. So they're, everybody's pretty much separated at this time. And then, of course, Jason is near the the house with all the kids are at. So, so this part is a uh, was it a trifecta sex all happening at the same time? So we have mm. Eddie and Melissa trying to hook up. We have Dave and Robin hooking up, and we have Ben and Kate hooking up, brother. All right. So Ben and Kate, they're in the van though. You know, they want to be a little bit more of the you know the, the wild people out there in the van hooking up. So Kate hears a little noise. And Ben thinks, oh, it's probably just Michael. He's just fu- fucking with us for a surprise birthday. So they open up the door. They say surprise. And then Ben's like, oh, I don't see him. I'll just go out there and look for him. And he's all like, where are you? Where are you, Michael? Where are you, Michael? And then Jason comes up right behind him and crushes his fucking head. So there he goes. And there's one more dead. Do you have any, uh, do you have any words for our boy Ben? His character development. Rest in, and... rest, rest in peace, Ben. No character development for Ben. It's just uh, 
yeah. is what it is. There was a cool uh, cut scene with him too, where you actually could see his whole head being smashed in by Jason. Except for this yeah. one, but they only like showed a little bit in the cut. So, like yeah, I said, that would have been yeah, that was a, cool. a lot of the death scenes would have made this movie a lot more like float a lot better. Like it made it, yeah. you know, you know, it, they had they actually had some really creative death scenes in this film that yeah. were hurt yeah. because of the rating. So, um, so then Kate is wondering where Eddie's, um, um, Kate's wondering where Ben's at, and she looks out through the window, and then uh, Jason puts a funnel on her eye. Have you ever been yeah. killed by a funnel oh. in the eye before? <laughs> no, I thought that was just a weird, random light death scene. Yes. Like, they just used a funnel. So, apparently, Melissa, she is not really into Eddie. Because our boy Eddie was ready to go. And she's like, no, we're going to stop it right now. All right? And she's like, you know what, Eddie? I just lied to you. I wasn't really into you. I was just trying to make Nick jealous. And I thought he would be in here by now to stop it. But apparently, he's not. So, Eddie's like, oh. It's like rejection, huh? I could take rejection. I got rejected three times from my science class and shit. <laughs> and how? And, and then he's get up. She's like, "Where are you going?" He's like, "I'm gonna take a cold shower and I have a date with the soap on a rope." It's like, what the fuck does that? Mean? I don't gonna, know what that means. He's gonna jack off with <laughs> some soap or some shit. Like, I I don't know what that means. I don't know. Stick it up I his ass. I, like, I, I, I guess no so. I guess so. I I don't know what that means. I have no. I mean, it's like '80s shit that I don't know anything about. Are you telling me in the '80s people were jacking off with soap? I don't, maybe, I don't know. I'm guessing. I have no idea what he's talking about. Well, he was happy about it, so. <laughs> so now Dan and Robin, they finish. Okay, so they got to do some sex. All right. And this is when Jason, he goes out there and pulls the power. And Robin, she wants some more sex. But she is, she and Dan are very high. And uh, Dan, he wants to go, um, he wants to go and get uh, some some beer. Okay. Yeah. Or Ben. Sorry, his name is Ben. He wants to go and get some beer. So, so now Jason's he's in the house and stuff. Okay. And uh, actually, it is Dan. The 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 guy in in the tent. He was Ben. So Dan, he's hungry and shit. All right. So you know they're both stoned and everything. And he leaves to go get some food. And he's like walking. I obviously he's like walking on some blood. But, like, I don't know who did. I don't think Jason killed anybody in the house yet. So, I'm not sure what he was slipping on. Did he kill anybody in the house yet, Jason? No, right? Um, I can't remember at this point. I know he does later on, but I can't yeah. remember if we're there yet or not. Yeah, it was just weird. He's, like, slipping on something. And he goes into the fridge and he gets stabbed by Jason. Okay, there he goes. So, uh, Tina goes back to the house to look for the uh, for the mom and to look for the pistol. And they go to Cruz's room, and they see that Cruz actually had the spike this whole time, so she doesn't think she's crazy. And he just so happens to have a books about the Crystal Lake murders and Jason. So just so happens. It just so happens to have it. And I'm not really sure what his plan was. Like, at first, I was thinking, okay, maybe he's trying to harness these powers so he can use Tina to resurrect Jason and have himself some sort of mutant army. But that was never really explained. <laughs> No, none of that. None of it was explained what he was actually going to do with her powers. So that's what I thought he was going to be doing. Because why the else? Why, right. why? Why? Why would he even have these books about Jason in the first place if he didn't, was going to use exactly. them for something? Exactly. So. Um, unless they were. I mean, did, were they in his stuff though? Yeah, or, or they were, were in they his just bookcase. In the house? No, they, they were, were in his, oh, they were, okay. his office and everything that he made in there. So they're all there, okay. clips and everything. He got the old. Uh, Tommy Jarvis clips in there, you know, fucking. Yeah, because I was thinking that I mean, other than Cruz, yeah, these we're... are the only this this is the only Friday the Thirteenth movie where the characters knew nothing about Jason. Yeah, none of them did. I mean, they I yeah. guess they kind of maybe knew like the lore or something, but none of them really did. I mean, and that fucking Tina, she lived there for a long time, so well, interesting. So now Eddie's he's uh, reading cards, okay, and Melissa leaves. She like sneaks out behind him. And Eddie's opening up a bunch of presents that were supposed to be for Mike. And he opens up a present that's a penis and larger. Ha, ha, ha. Comedy. <laughs> we have comedy. Funny. Funny. Funny joke. So Nick's, uh, she's taking Tina downstairs. And they both have a gun now, too. Because that's what they're in there to get the pistol. All right. And so 
So they already figured out that, okay, the man that Tino awoke is Jason. All right. So now Nick wants to get everybody and leave. Okay. And Tina just basically wants to stay there and get her mom. So Jason's around there. He's uh, So Jason now is behind Eddie and he kills Eddie. Kind of a cool scene. He just walks up behind her. Mm-hmm. Eddie thinks it's Melissa. It's not. And then he gets stabbed in the neck. Basically gets his head cut off. So Robin, she is now getting dressed. Okay. And Robin's looking around the house for Dave and Maddie. And she goes into some random person's room. She sees a bunch of weed smoke and some... I got some weed smoke and some killers at the door. Okay. She got some uh, weed smoke yes. there. <laughs> and basically, Jason comes in. No, no. She 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 sits down and she pets a cat. And she looks over. She sees Dave, dead Dave's head. Okay. And then mm-hmm. Jason comes in and throws the bitch out of the window. Okay. Um, there was actually a better scene with her that was cut as well, too, which I thought flowed a lot better, where she was in the room, and she hears a knock. She thinks it's Dave, but it's Jason. He comes out, and he he shows, like, he's in the front of the hallway, and he shows Robin Dave's dead head. He, like, shows it to her, and she freaks out, and he goes over there and stabs the bitch. I thought that was way better than what they did here. But, you know, sensors and shit, so we gotta change up shit. Mm. Um, so after he throws the girl out of the window, she just dies from coming out the window. So she, unlike, unlike all the eighties final girls who get thrown out a window and survive, she dies. Okay. Yeah. She was pretty fragile. Yes. If you think about it, it's probably all that weed smoke and sex. Probably. You know what I mean? It gets a little fragile there. So, uh, Tina wants to, uh, stay while, and then basically Nick's going to go look for everybody and he goes in the house. And he doesn't see anybody around. Uh, so now Jason's in the woods. All right. Mom is screaming. Tina. Where are you, Tina? <laughs> Tina, Tina. And of course, um, of course, Jason's probably hearing the shit. All right. And then uh, he knows that Cruz knows that Jason's out there. You know, so he's like, hey, we got to get out of these woods like right now. And we got to And he's like, well, what about Tina? We got to find her. It's like, oh, he's probably she's probably back at the house and shit. We gotta get out of here because he's here. She's like, no, you're just a coward and stuff. And then Jason walks up with some fucking hedge cutters and shit. Where is he getting all this shit from? I mean, I'm I'm assuming that he's just finding it around the house, you know, like in, you know, the sheds they might have around there. But yeah, he just, but well, it gets even worse than this. But like he, he finds all these like devices to kill people with just yeah. out of nowhere. Like it's not even like he finds them. Like that's my thing is it doesn't even show him. It just shows up. I think them. that's one. Right, he, like that's one of my biggest complaints about Jason, is I think this movie and part six to an extent created that um, stereotype, I guess, of Jason just appearing out of nowhere, the teleporting Jason. Yeah, because he didn't really do it before these two movies, where he's just like you know, like like people always tell the joke of like Jason's like really slow, and then people run away from him, and then all of a sudden they'll just run right into him and die. Yeah. And that's just kind of how it is in this movie. Like he'll like you'll have a scene where people are trying to get away and then he'll just like step out from behind a tree with like you know like a weed whacker and just kill you or something. Yeah, all kinds really, of weapons. Really, yeah. So n- n- the mom and Cruz are running and then Cruz like stops her and then Jason comes up behind her and stabs her. So the uh, t- so Tina's dream of seeing her mom stab came to t- came to life while Cruz hold her. So now we have Nick. He's he can't find anybody, but he eventually sees dead Eddie's head near like the little bush plant, and he gets on out of there. He goes back to Tina's house, and he he sees he's looking around, and he eventually runs into Melissa, and he tells Melissa, "Hey, don't go back into the house because Mike and Eddie they're both dead." All right. So Tina's in the woods mm-hmm. looking for the mom now, and she runs into Cruz, and uh, Cruz is like, "Hey, you know we should." Uh, we should get out of here and stuff. And she's like, well, well I, I got to get my mom. Where's my mom at? She's like, oh, I haven't seen her. She's probably gone. And she's like, hey, why do you got blood on you? <laughs> like, what, what's going hey. on over here? He's like, we got to get out of here now. We got to run. Just don't go in the woods. Don't go in there. And then she goes in there. She's like, oh, shit. Why she go in there? <laughs> <laughs> and and then, it, it's, and then it's, after yeah. Tina leaves, next thing we know, we hear a fucking chainsaw. And I'm like, did I, are we on the wrong movie? 
Like, what's going on here with this chainsaw? And then next thing we know, we have Jason. And you're more of the tool guy, Alice. So what the hell is this thing? Is it like a, a tree clipper or something? It yeah, it's like a um, it's a it it's it's it kind of, yeah. So it's like you know how you can have like like those weed whacker things that have the string on them, and you can like cut down like tall grass with. Yeah, it's like that, but you can buy steel blades for them. So it's like one of those, and you can use it to like cut limbs off of trees and things. Yeah, so that's what it is. Um, but like he just gets it out of nowhere, and it has gas in it, and he can start it. He just pulls it out of nowhere. <laughs> So, yeah, and it yeah. was weird because Cruz like, oh, I'm gonna get out of here. So Cruz like maybe wa- maybe the lens runs like maybe like two minutes at the most, and then he stops yeah. to take a breath. And I'm like, what the fuck? Then he did, Jason just comes up to him and he just falls and then he gets chained to death. And I'm like, okay, well there he and, goes. <laughs> right, and and also like I know this is probably should have run up earlier, but like, so what time of year is this supposed to be? Is this supposed to be summer? I mean, the girl's skinny dipping, so it can't be that cold that's, out there. Right, that's what I'm thinking. So she goes skinny dipping, but in some scenes they're wearing coats. And, I mean, we know that it was filmed in, like, October and November, yeah. so it's clearly not summer, although in Alabama it'd still be warmer. But yeah, you can tell by looking at it that it's not summer when it was filmed. But, like, but in some scenes they're wearing jackets, but it's warm enough for them to swim. Like, it's just confusing as to when this is supposed to take place. But yeah. Anyway, I just wanted to point that out. Well, you know, in the Friday series, it, it's not cold when you're naked. And when you're not naked, it is cold. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so now, now that our boy Cruz is gone, now we see Tina. She's wandering around the woods. And now she sees the dead mom. So she's upset. And then she sees Jason. And Jason... Uh, she, then she sees the dead Kate. All right. Mm-hmm. And then she sees pretty much everybody's dead. She sees the dead Maddie. She sees the dead Sandra. She sees the dead Ben. And she runs away. Yeah, this is this is the trope from one and two and three, right? Where there's yeah. one of the characters that runs into all the dead bodies that they somehow are able to collect. Yes. And then she sees she's and then we have like a staring contest a lot with them. So Tina and Jason <laughs> stare at each other for a little bit. And then she uses her telekinesis to wrap Jason in a tree in a puddle, and then she electrocutes him. Alright? Yeah. Because remember, she is the one who can defeat Jason on their mind. So Well, for well, for one, we know electricity brings him back to life. Like he's like Frankenstein. But I guess yeah, she did he just get that. powered up then? I guess. Yeah, he, she I don't guess know so, yeah. So I think he just powered him up. She didn't know that. Yeah. But like, yeah. So she just electrocutes him in a puddle. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, all right, so fine. fine. So then Jason gets right, back up and she runs away. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> God damn it! This is. Dumb. I did. I did, anyway, I did like this go. scene though. I did like this scene though. So when Tina she runs back to the house, right? And now, since mm-hmm. we're saying so, I didn't I didn't realize this by watching it, but when you brought it up, like that is how he came back to life was that blue eighties yeah. lightning from electricity. And then he, he's in the puddle and he wakes up. So now mm-hmm. he's so supercharged that right <laughs> when he gets in the house, he breaks through the window himself without throwing a body. He just runs yeah. and breaks through the window because <laughs> he's ready to go, brother. Maybe it's like so good. maybe like the eighties blue lightning is like his spinach. You know what I mean? Yeah, it, it, yeah. it absolutely has to be right. He's yeah. like superpowered now. But it's it's um, now this is to me. <clears throat> we're probably like what ten minutes from the end of the movie, maybe. Yeah, a little bit there. Yeah, so, something like that. So this is when the movie starts getting good to yeah, me, yeah. like where it starts getting entertaining. And I think that it starts getting entertaining because at this point you can tell that a lot of the things he's doing, um, Kane Hodder himself had a lot of input and in, input in what they were doing. Yeah, and he took a lot like of the stunts changed, himself. Could, yeah, yeah, he did all the stunts himself because he's a stunt man. But he he had input because like a lot of those things weren't going to go the way the the original stunt was not written the way that he actually it was actually performed. But he wanted to make it go further, and like and and it was so good because he would literally do anything yeah. that they wanted him to do. Like he just like he just jumped through that window. Yeah, I um, thought that scene was awesome. Yeah, that looked great. So now, I, I mean, I don't even know how you would even do that. Like, you, well, you'd have to build a window big enough for a guy that big to jump through, not hit his head. Yeah, but. Um, but yeah, I mean, just how many times do you have to do that to get it right? I mean, maybe he's really, he just did it once, but yes, I like it my, looked great. I do like my notes here. So now they stare at each other and she uses her Freddy powers 
to <laughs> to throw uh, a couch, and they throw that. Then she throws the little tree with Eddie's head on it. Uh, Jason. Yeah. <laughs> and then she eventually drops the fucking roof on his ass. Yes. <laughs> so apparently, he took the whole roof on too. Uh, Hotter did. <laughs> Yeah, and, and then uh, when oh. he comes out of the roof, his hand oh. just shoots up to it. It's yeah. fucking great. So now, yeah. now Nick and Melissa they're in the you know they're in Tina's house, and then Tina yeah. gets back there and she says like, "Oh, they got my mom." She didn't give a fuck about anybody else. <laughs> she got my mom. Oh yeah, what about Russell? Who? Okay. Who? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, <laughs> these are not people she really knew. So. So now, or basically, Melissa, she's like, nah, you guys are creeping me out, and I don't believe any of y'all. And they're like, oh, where are you going? It's like, well, I'm going to go back to the house and sleep, because fuck all y'all. So she opens up the door, right? And then Jason, this is an awesome scene. This is a fucking awesome scene. So she opens up the door. She sees Jason. She's like, oh, shit, this motherfucker's real. And then Jason just axes her in the fucking head and takes her and throws her ass across the room. I was like, that is a great scene. And the uh, the uh, director's cut looked really good because you actually see the axe go into her skull. So that yes. shit was cool looking. So now Tina and Jason are fighting upstairs. She like does her Freddy powers to use a light on his head and he falls through the stairs. So they think he's gone, but then he eventually breaks through the stairs like the Hulk. All right, Jason smash. Well, <laughs> yeah, so that was a really cool scene too. Yeah. So with that one when they he that well wait a minute so yeah this is when she he she he's walking up the steps yeah and, he and then she makes the light hit him in the face right yeah, and he falls and he breaks through the and he like kind of busts out of the closet area underneath the stairs yeah like the kool-aid man yeah so like that was um that was all his idea too yeah. so originally the light wasn't gonna hit him in the face yeah. um so he wanted the light to hit him in the face because he's like well it's okay because i'm wearing a hockey mask but when they built those steps though they're all real except for three of them. So like when he jumped backwards after hitting, getting hit in the face, the three, three of the steps were made out of balsa wood. So he had to hit those steps, go through the steps and fall through that hole. Otherwise he's like smashing himself up on real steps, um, which I thought was kind of cool. This, yeah. you know, that he, like he designed all that and then he just breaks through the other side, like the Kool-Aid man. And then he's after him again. Yeah. And he grabs uh, Nick. He starts choking his ass and he's about to break his back until Tina uses some more of her uh, telekinesis powers. All right. And then she uses a light cord, like a light wire to mm -hmm. lift Jason up and choke him. I'm just like, bro, this has to be the strongest light cord ever right? <laughs> to lift up this Jason creature. And at this time, she also used her, the powers when it happened. Uh, he broke, they broke the mask. So we actually could see the, the zombie like Jason's face, which I thought it looked pretty good. Jason's yeah, I face. mean, it looks pretty good for what it is. Yeah. I mean, it, it you know, it's at this point he's just a zombie, but yeah, but yeah, I mean, it looks really good. I think it looks pretty good. And then he's like, you know, he's like roaring at her or something because he's with his yeah. zombie face. But they destroyed the mask, so what yeah. are we gonna do in the future? How are we gonna get another mask? I don't know, bro. It's destroyed now, so we'll have to figure that out in a year's time. Yeah. So he falls through the hole, and uh, Tina goes checks on Nick. Jason wakes up, pulls her down to the hole, and now she's using nails on his head. And she's like, hey, you know what? You know, Carrie, she used she used fire. So I'm kind of like Carrie. So I'm going to start using some gasoline that's handy to be down here. And I'm going to light his ass up. So that's what she does. She uses some gasoline mm -hmm. on Jason. Uh, Nick eventually wakes up. And she lights the, the gasoline on fire. And Nick and, um, and uh, Tina get on out of there. They run. And the house eventually blows up. Up, right? So they're on the they're on the port they're the bridge like you know the little water bridge, all right. And you know it's like she's like oh everything's all over you know everything's fine. But then Jason appears, all right, mm -hmm. out of nowhere. And he grabs fucking t uh, a Tina throws her ass and he's gonna go after fucking Nick. Nick shoots him three times. Should have done six times. There's only then three. It, it might have stopped him. Might have stopped him. And then Tina uses her telekinesis power that she just learned how to master just in this one night to raise her dead father back to life for him to grab Jason and pull him down under the water. And that's when we cut to the next scene. 
of her getting pulled away in an ambulance. We see the Jason mask, the fire, the fire guys looking at the Jason burn up mask. It's broken. It's gone for good. And it was a very thin mask too. Yeah, I very thin. Of course, it you know had been under the water for <laughs> ten years. Yeah, we gotta get this but... guy a new one. All right. So, uh, so now she's asking, "Where is, uh, where is uh, Nick?" I thought it was gonna be another one of those dream sequences that we get in every Friday film, but it wasn't. We just see Nick and Tina in the ambulance together. All right, and they're basically saying it's all over. All right, and they said like, "Yes." We took care of him. For, yep, for, took care of Jason. We took care of his ass. So, so apparently in the the cut version, there was a couple of different ways they wanted to end it. Uh, the first one I thought would have been like would have made a little bit more sense of when mm-hmm. Tina resurrected her dad. He actually looked like a zombie, like an actual like dead zombie grabbing Jason underneath the water. But I guess one of the producers didn't like that. They didn't like there being a zombie for some reason. And, Even uh, though Jason's a zombie, yes, but still, and so they, that's why they just made him look like normal. And then there was a scene too that they cut where you see a, a fisher, this guy, this random dude doing fishing, and Jason pulls him under the water to show that he's still alive. So they cut both of those scenes out, but those were two scenes that were, you know, could have made the movie a little bit more exciting. But uh, but that's it, everybody. That is the Friday the Thirteenth Part Seven, the New yep. Blood. Not bad. Wasn't my favorite. Better than six. Yeah, but to, to me, I think we, I think me and you can agree that we like this better than six. Yeah. Um, I actually thought a lot of the characters and the, you know, they're pretty fun. You know what I mean? Pretty good death scenes. Um, you know, the the whole telekinesis thing, I probably could have done without, but I could see where you know we had to have like somebody match up to Jason. Even though he got beaten like every fucking movie, I don't know why we need somebody to match up to him. But you know, we couldn't get Freddy, so we got Carrie instead, brother. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can definitely tell they're they're definitely going downhill. Even though this is a little better than six, yeah, you can just tell that they're just like four should have been the end of it. Well, no, I kind of like five. I like five, but they should have followed through with that idea with yeah. there being like a brand new killer. Yeah. It's yeah, that's true. Trying to bring Jake back. But yeah, but everybody, we will be back here next week for the final for us installment of the Friday the Thirteenth <laughs> series. We have made it to number eight. We will be seeing Jason yeah. how he takes Manhattan for about mm. ten minutes. For, yes, <laughs> should be fantastic. <laughs> we, we can see him take a boat, basically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I also have a very special um, audio piece to go along with Friday the 13th Part 8 as well, too. And I will say what that is on the podcast, and I think everybody out there is going to love this because I have a very special audio piece that I'll be playing at the end of that episode. Awesome. So everybody look out for that. I think all of you all are going to enjoy that a lot here on the Retro Blood Under the Course. We will be coming back here for two lights out, brother. Because in October, brother, you don't get one, you get two. Yeah, it's first special one month for us. Special month, brother. The first one's going to be me and Allison are going to battle it out, brother, right in the square circle as me and him battle the Halloween Havocs. 1999 versus 1994. Should be a fun one. It's going to be a, a good old time. We're going to go down match by match to see which matches are better. We're going to see the finishes. We're going to see some, 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 some tits. We're going to see some action in the ring. We're going to see some good old-fashioned wrestling. It's going to be a good time. Mm, it's going to be a good time. And then... Follow us along for that. On Halloween, Lights Out will return, brother, for a full discussion of a film that wasn't made in 1998. Or 1988, my bad. Mm-hmm. It was uh, made in 2003 of Freddy vs. Jason. Yep, we finally get the idea for that they were going to use for Part 7 in 2003. Yes. Which is ironic because Part 7 takes place in 2002. Yes. So it makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. All right. And then, of course, the Halloween edition of the Retro Blood, that is going to be a secret until uh, next week. And we will tell you what the October 29th Retro Blood is going to be. That's going to be a very fun one because... 
boy, that is probably my favorite party Halloween movie of all time. And I'll be marking out during the whole show. I'll probably be drinking heavily on that show. But it's going to be a fun mm-hmm. one, guys. So so join us here for the Retro Blood our October month. I'll probably have a couple of shorts, um, the, the little video style um, uh, review show that we do on YouTube. I'll have a couple of those up. And also, too, if you guys want to find the full episodes, you can also find them on YouTube as well, too. So it's another platform for you all to listen to our stuff on. And, of course, you know, follow the Instagram, Retro Blood Official, the Facebook. Tell us how you guys think of the podcast. Tell us, Give us a five-star. Give us on there. Tell us how you like yeah. it. Yeah, yeah just us give us a five-star review. If you hate the show, yeah. just keep it to yourself. Yeah. Well, even if you hate <laughs> it, better, I don't know why you'd be it. listening if you hated the show. <laughs> But you know, I I'll guess take on the know. haters, brother. I'll take them all. Up. I don't give a fuck. I'm like our boy, fucking. Uh, I'm like our boy Nick. Mm. You know what I mean? I'm out here, ran with the bad crowd. And now I'm trying to make my life better by fucking this telekinesis yeah. bitch. You know, good to go. Exactly. That'll make your life better. <laughs> but Austin, what what song should we play off this fucking great Judas Priest album? I mean, there's so many oh, fucking we gotta good play, tracks. So yeah, we got to play. Ram-